Joseph Calder, the Museum of Museum, 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 the Southeast inter Group and the hospitals of Southeastern Massachusetts. Now I'll start with uh, a few acknowledgments. Uh, very grateful for all the hard work that the Southeast inter Group, and in particular the Conference Planning Group, put into this conference. Uh, at, at the risk of singling people out is not, not always a good thing, but uh, I'll take a risk of perhaps leaving somebody out who should be singled out, but I, I want to make sure, and I don't even think they're in the room right now, because they're actively working outside, but Marsha Picard and Marianne D'Souza were, were key uh, supporters and workers on this conference. Um, as the lead person for the Department of Public Health, they made sure that I was constantly kept on my toes and making sure that everything was running smoothly. So I particularly want to thank Marianne and Marsha for their, their outstanding contributions. To the conference. And as, as we were planning the conference, we extended an invitation to the community benefits officers of the hospitals in the southeast region to join us. There. Many of them were already at the table at the Chennai, but for this particular event, we invited them to join us in the planning effort, and many did. And then we took a step further and said, you know, it would be great if you could uh, provide sponsorship, provide some funding to support the conference, and uh, provide an exhibit. And not to ask for too much, we said, oh, by the way, would you like to do a presentation about some successful collaboration that you've done that's consistent with the theme? And you know, they came through in, in, in amazing fashion. You'll see the exhibit tables, the, the sponsorships, and the presentations that you'll hear today are all an important part of the collaboration uh, about which this conference has been planned. And you know, I, I, I couldn't help but notice, and maybe you did, but the, the color scheme for the conference is you know, shades of blue. And, and wouldn't you know that all the table covers for the exhibits are a shade of blue? And that just, how much more can you say about collaboration and working together than to have done that? Uh, and then finally, I want to acknowledge the support that we have from the Massachusetts Public Health Association uh, in, in planning this conference. We, we had the wisdom of inviting them to the table to join us early on in the planning. We had a lot of support from Andrea Freeman and her colleagues, Maddie Ribble and Toby Fisher from MPHA and helping to plan, plan this conference. And I think it's a, a wonderful, uh, I wouldn't call it a start, but a, an ongoing effort to uh, continue the presence of MPH here and support for MPH here in the Southeast region. So with that, uh, I'm gonna provide a little bit of background to today's conference. So the, the, the concept for this conference started with the DPH priorities which were established under Commissioner Auerbach shortly after he came on board in 2007. And uh, he, in collaboration with a number of different stakeholders, the department came up with, with five uh, priorities in 2007, 2008. And those are the first five listed there, supporting the successful implementation of health care reform, reducing racial and ethnic health disparities, promoting wellness, chronic disease, uh, prevention and management, strengthening local and regional public health. And then more recently, as Governor Patrick started in his second term, we added the prevention of youth violence as another priority within the department. So today's conference is built in large part on that first priority. As, as you may know, in 2006, Massachusetts passed um, landmark health care reform, which it was primarily intent was to promote uh, health insurance coverage to ensure that every resident in Massachusetts had health insurance. And I'm pleased to report that 98% of Massachusetts residents now have health insurance as a result of that health care reform. And there are a number of other provisions of the health care reform law, two that I'm going to note here. One was reducing health disparities resulted in the formation of the Massachusetts Health Disparities Council. And the second was a promotion of the role of community health workers, an important part of the, the health care team. And I know we have many community health workers here today, and I'm pleased to see that, that they are here because they're such an important part of the, the conversation that we'll have moving forward. And then folks are familiar with the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010, 
at the national level, and that, again, was a device to improve access to health insurance coverage nationwide. It had a number of other key provisions. The focus also on promoting population health, um, increasing access to preventive health services, and lastly, the, the creation of the Prevention and Public Health Fund, or I think it's called the Public Health and Prevention Fund, has um, provided uh, a large sum of money. Some of it's been carved away in recent years, but a large sum of money in support of um, prevention and public health at the, at the national level. And Massachusetts has benefited uh, to a large extent from those funds. Uh, and then most recently was the cost containment measure, the Massachusetts Payment Reform Law, Chapter 224, recently signed by the governor. And again, that was a package with a number of provisions, one, but the key of which was to control health care costs. The recognition that, okay, we've got people with health insurance, but health care health care still costs way too much in this country and in Massachusetts. And we need to uh, redirect our resources and, and achieve some cost savings in health care. And that's an allocation of $60 million uh, over the next five years in support of prevention initiatives. And Leah Susan will talk about that in a while. Um, I'm going to quickly mention the, the triple aim that the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, started in uh, 2007 as a framework for looking at healthcare reform. And I'm sorry, I encourage you to do a deeper dive into this. This could be an entire conference. But the, the notion is that there are three aims of uh, reformed health care. And that's improving the individual experience of care, reducing the per capita cost of care. And lastly, and this is most relevant to today, is improving the health of populations. So I encourage you that um, the Institute of uh, Healthcare Improvement is based in Cambridge. And Dr. Donald Berwick, who for a time was the director of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid system uh, services at the federal level uh, was a, a key author of that. But one of the, one of the things we know is um, there's sort of this, there are issues beyond having a health insurance card. I suspect that everybody in this room has a health insurance card, and that gets you access to the health care system, um, which, which some have described as, to some extent as a sick care system. Uh, not a sick care system, but a system that's designed to deliver <laughs> sick care. Uh, you know, treat people when they're ill, and as opposed to promoting health. And I know a lot of the providers of health care here certainly promote health, but it's still largely designed to um, deal with people when they're sick. And but there are many more elements to this. That the having access to health insurance itself does not ensure access to health. And a couple of key issues there. One is looking at the social determinants of health as well as, you know, I, I see, and I know the, the Plymouth Chennai in particular has a strong interest in health literacy, that just because you have a health insurance card doesn't, doesn't mean you know how to navigate the system. It's a very complex system, and the more health literacy in, includes the notion of make sure you understand how to use the system. We'll have a quick slide about that, too. But here's the, um, the Boston Foundation has now produced two reports. One, uh, last year, the first annual report card, Healthy People, Healthy Economy. And I, I love this slide because it, it points out on the left-hand side, you may not be able to see it very well, and I encourage you to read the report, uh, the 2011 report as well as the one that just came out recently. But at the top on the left, in the green box, is one of the determinants of health is access to health care. Small part, 10% of, uh, of the the things that actually determine one's health, uh, as opposed, in addition to genetics, environment, and healthy behavior. But if you look at where the resources go, where the dollars are spent, national health expenditures, um, over 80% of national health expenditures, expenditures go um, in support of access to health care. Well, a small fraction, um, 4%, uh, and some, I've heard numbers as low as 3% are going towards addressing healthy behaviors and other determinants of health. Again, another report that I encourage you. And one, one thing I want to point out is we have everybody's email address so that after the conference we're going to send you uh, a resource link to a number of these documents on the PowerPoint presentations. I um, just want to quickly point out that uh, another element of, of health care reform is the notion of health equity. And I'm not going to read this to you. Some many of you are probably familiar with with the notion of health equity. It's something that the Department of Public Health and, and the State Executive Office of Health and, health and Human Services fully embraces. As, um, as I see it as a, 
Um, let's skip through that one. As a, as a necessary and achievable goal of health care reform, that ensuring not that everybody has equal access, but that, that the system is designed such that it's uh, respectful of everybody's um, health care and, and social needs um, as well. So health, health literacy is another topic that we just want to get on people's agenda as we look at look at the work that we'll be doing in population health. And this one I will read because uh, health literacy is the degree to which an individual has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. So that's, that's the part where we say, you know, having a health insurance card is, is not your ticket to health. Health literacy in combination with your health insurance card is, is certainly a, a better combination. Uh, Commissioner Auerbach uh, presented a slide similar to this, and he looked at three different areas of prevention. Uh, there's the clinical preventive me measures, that those that happen in hospitals, community health centers, and, uh, and, and doctor's offices and other health care settings. Another dimension or another area of pathways to prevention is uh, community health, those that are done by community-based organizations, by um, community health network areas, and they developed this concept of the gray zone, that there are, uh, that there's prevention that happens somewhere in between or in a combination or a mix of community uh, organizations and in, in traditional healthcare clinical settings. So it calls that the gray zone, and in particular, who, who, kind of, who does the work in this gray zone? Community health workers do that work. They bridge the gap between community and, and the clinical setting, provide important services there. Public health nurses provide that support. And some examples of the kinds of uh, community slash clinical preventive services that we <coughs> talked about are chronic disease self-management and, and smoking cessation. Things that are clinically managed but also managed in the community. So who are community health workers? I have to do a plug for community health workers for my, my friends at the Massachusetts Association of Community Health Workers. Um, because both the, the Affordable Care Act and Massachusetts Health Reform for 2006 both acknowledge the important role that community health workers can play in, um, in a reformed health care system. And community health workers are public health professionals who pr promote full and equal access to necessary health and social services. I won't continue to read the rest, but the key element here is they establish a relationship built on trust and knowledge of the community and the people with whom they work, important players in, in a reformed health care system. Now, a lot of activities uh, that promote health in the southeast region are, there are a number of different funding streams for that. One is certainly the community benefits work that, that the hospitals do. Each of the hospitals are represented here today. They, they contribute tens of millions of dollars for community benefit. Another funding stream that supports the work of the community health networks, and Dave will talk a little more about this, is a determination of need community health initiatives program uh, run by the Department of Public Health. And that, that provides uh, funding in this region of somewhere between five and six million dollars over the next half a dozen years to, to the various community health networks in the southeast region. And we'll hear a lot more about what they do, what the Chinas do with those funds. But uh, these principles are ones that can guide us in our collaborative work uh, in the coming years. One is a focus on a broad definition of health, physical, mental, and social, and I'm particularly pleased that we'll, as part two of the presentations this morning, that we'll hear from uh, some of the collaborative projects with hospitals and community health centers are involved in areas of mental health. We'll hear from the Helping Children Cope uh, program at uh, South Shore Hospital at Friends of Hope. We'll also hear about the Youth Suicide Prevention Project at, at, on the Cape. And another element of the Determination Need program when we look at how, what kinds of projects will be funded are those that promote personal and collective empowerment. So the large part there is the role of community health workers and others to support effective health services, 
to build sustainable capacity for community health promotion involving multiple, multiple partners. And that, indeed, is uh, an underlying theme of today's conference. And I know you're all watching me to see if I'm going to trip, but I, I promise you I won't. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be okay. Yeah, Dave's got the camera going here, so I'm being very careful. <laughs> um, so, you know, some additional pathways to prevention is defined by the, uh, the affordable, uh, by um, Affordable Care Act and, and health care reform, uh, community-based outreach and health education, uh, environmental strategies to promote health, reduce risks, and prevent injury. Uh, Leah Susan will talk about one of my favorite comments I've heard Dr. Dr. Lawrence Smith make is, you know, we talk a lot about making the healthy choice the easy choice. And she, she's drawn the analogy about making the healthy choice in our life ought not to be like walking uphill in a snowstorm. <laughs> and policy development, uh, changes in policy that, that can promote good health. And I think we've learned a lot of lessons from, from tobacco control that the work that's done in tobacco control over the last 20 years uh, has had a significant effect on, on tobacco use and smoking rates. And that wasn't as much about individual behavior change and smoking cessation as it was about changing the, the, environment, the environmental strategies around uh, smoking cessation, around smoking. Uh, I tried to think as I came here today, when is the last time I actually saw somebody smoking in public? And it's, it's compared to 20 years ago, it was much more frequent. And, and uh, of course, our office in New Bedford is right next to a Dunkin' Donuts, and I realize it's probably every day I see somebody smoking, but it's certainly not, uh, not, uh, certainly not as frequent. Uh, any case, but that's a, you know, a good example of how policy change taxation has certainly had an impact on, on smoking rates and, and consumption of cigarettes. So policy development, and Leah Susan will talk about some strategies around that. But coalition building and maintenance, leadership training, workforce development, these are all terms and ideas that you folks are all familiar with, and, and other population-based and community level or system change strategies. So my, my last thing to talk about this morning is about community health needs assessment, because it's a perfect example of where collaboration works and collaboration is necessary. As you can see, there, there's a number of different places where uh, there are expectations for community health needs assessments. The Attorney General's Community Benefits uh, Program requires or expects uh, nonprofit uh, acute care hospitals to do a community health needs assessment. The um, Department of Public Health Determination of Need Program in allocating funds to CHANAS and other community-based coalitions requires that a community health needs assessment be conducted. The Affordable Care Act requires uh, nonprofit hospitals to conduct a community health needs assessment. And the Department of Public Health, in our encouragement and support for uh, the formation of public health districts, collaborations among public and local health entities, requires that they also conduct a community health needs assessment. And there's no point in, in, in hospitals, CHANAs, local health departments each conducting their own needs assessment. But there is value. We're already seeing this happening uh, in the southeast region where hospitals, health departments, and, and CHANAs and other community-based organizations <coughs> such as the United Way are, are, are collaborating in assessing the needs. The duplication of effort around needs assessment is um, not the best use of resources. Um, Check my notes here. So today's today's conference is is about collaboration, and we're we're launching a new era of collaboration. That was a title that the, the planning committee came up with, and collaboration has happened in this region for many for many years. Uh, I've I've been working in this region for three decades now, or nearly three decades, and I've seen collaboration happening all the time. I think a lot of this now is driven is driven by what's happening with healthcare reform, the expectations. Um, that the healthcare system and the community health system work even more closely together than they already have. And but my last comment is uh, how, how delighted I am to see the number of people in the room here today. Uh, we recently, the department recently had its annual ounce of prevention conference in Marlboro. And in our, our recent debriefing on the conference, we reviewed the, 
the attendance list, and it was noted that we had a good representation from across Massachusetts at the conference, but the point was made that, except the Southeast region wasn't as well represented as other regions. In fact, out of the 450 people at that conference, there were 27 from the Southeast region, and I bet most of those 27 are in this room today. Um, I, I can now happily report back to Boston that the Southeast region is alive and well and thriving in its efforts and commitment to um, And I'll just put up my contact information slide for those who want to get in touch with me. I'd be glad to, to talk with you if you have any questions. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Weed from Partners for a Healthy Community in Fall River, who's going to, as I said earlier, he's going to answer all your questions, I think, <laughs> us, because Dave and I, yeah. Yeah. David and I have been Dave. partners in crime in this work for, for probably those entire three decades. Um, and uh, I see Gene DeCock here also, who's been a Chana follower and leader for, for all those 20 years that Chanas have existed. And I, I don't want to say any much more about Chana because Dave's got this great presentation all lined up, so I'm going to turn it over to him. But I thank you all very much for being here today, and I look forward to spending the day with you. Thank you. My job is to uh, introduce you to each other. Okay. Um, I'd like to start by asking all of those people who work for a hospital, a community health center, private practice, and who are not currently active with their chana to raise your hand. Good. Okay. Not that many people will get you before the end of the day <laughs> to be active with your chana. So more than likely, you know already the people in your chana, correct? Okay. And what we need to do today, what we're going to learn about, is what are chanas, and then we're going to spend the, after, the rest of the morning and then the afternoon learning about the collaboration between your facilities and those chanas. And I think what's exciting about this is to see that Whatever you're busily engaged in within your local Chana, there are five others also working okay, on similar uh, kinds of projects. And when you put the whole collection together, uh, which is what we're doing today, we're going to see the lay of the land for the whole southeastern area. I think it's very impressive. And I, I think, Ron, uh, maybe the next ounce of prevention conference should be in Southeast, don't you think? Yeah. I was also kind of interested in uh, the term the gray zone, um, considering that that's the area of, of collaboration between uh, communities, uh, community projects and uh, medical care facilities. And, Having just gotten my Medicare, Medicare card this past week, I'm particularly sensitive to the term gray zone. <laughs> so let's start by looking at what a China is not. It's not a misspelling of China. Those of you who were at our previous conference a year ago saw someone in the hotel who inserted the I and the C-H-N-A thinking that we had made a spelling error. Um, there are a few other Chinas around. The, the College Hill Neighborhood Association in Providence uh, is a competitor. If you Google Chana, you will also find that, that the Healthy Communities Institute has a Chana system. And the term community health needs assessment, uh, which Ron alluded to, is something that you will hear in other settings because that that notion of doing a area-wide assessment of needs is not something unique to Massachusetts, it's around the country. So other people from out of state may think that a Chana is a community health needs assessment. You, of course, will correct them, right? If you uh, Google us, you'll find our pictures up there. Um, fortunately, Chana now nationally, internationally, means us. Okay, uh, so in Massachusetts, uh, we are in particular a coalition of public, nonprofit, and private services who work together. Right? 
Uh, and our chief task is community-based prevention planning and health promotion. And I like to think of, I'm glad you have the slide to, with the 4% uh, or 3% or maybe 2% that goes to health promotion and prevention. This is the one opportunity that communities have to do something, you know, the, the metaphor of, you know, I, I've been pulling people who are drowning out of the river over and over again. I decided to go up the river and find out who was pushing them in. Um, what we're looking at is why are people getting ill in the first place, okay, and what can we do to intervene in many years, in many situations, years in advance of, of developing chronic illnesses and other conditions that require that 94% of medical intervention. Um, and that's where the cost savings comes in. Uh, in Massachusetts, we're one of 27 uh, of uh, Chenaz, each Chenaz one of 27, and there are regions, uh, <coughs> regions throughout the, the Commonwealth that started in 92, so we are at our 20 year mark. So you would hope that after 20 years we have some idea of what we're doing, right? Uh, and all 351 towns belong, uh, whether they know it or not, uh, to a Chenaz. And I, I would have to say parenthetically that uh, because Janas are organized differently, are uh, composed of uh, different sets of people, and really in some ways have different visions and a different set of resources, you will see a lot of variety across the Commonwealth. Do not expect a kind of a rubber stamp approach to Janas everywhere you go. In fact, in some communities they're inactive. You won't hear much at all. And in, we like to think in southeast Massachusetts, we are the active group. Um, so there's the entire list of them, uh, organized by numbers. Uh, some of us use the numbers, uh, some of us do not. Many of us have changed our names. Uh, I come from uh, Chenna 25 in Fall River, and we refer to ourselves as the Greater Fall River Partners for a Healthier Community. Uh, so you'll not even hear the word Chana in our name. We try not to use that term uh, because it's a little difficult for people to grasp. But if you step outside of that and you want to talk about the common group of people, then you really have to talk about Chana's. Um, so as Ron suggested, we're committed to continuous improvement of health. Um, we look at project by project. We identify the kinds of things that we think need to be done, develop or look for the resources needed to address a particular issue, work at that, and then um, evaluate our progress. Um, there are similar paradigms for this kind of process. Uh, the Chana is not unique in, in, in this respect. But our job is to look at uh, the entire range of issues and concerns, look at the resources needed, and then prioritize those things that either we think are urgently in need of addressing or that we have the resources for. And I think that's an important aspect of this, is to understand that there often are issues that we think need to be addressed urgently but we also understand that we do not have the resources at this time to address those issues. So sometimes we're working a little further down on the list because that's something we can do. Um, we want to look at outcomes and a means of evaluation and understand uh, what progress we're making. Um, one of our objectives uh, has been to reduce the rate of smoking. It's still high in Fall River. Uh, a variety of things have happened, not all of the things that we've done, but over the past 10 years we've been able to bring the smoking rate down about 14 percent. Now in an area that's still too high, uh, it's something that we look to as a good measure of the kinds of things that are going on. We're also looking at uh, youth violence rates, which have been going down in the city. We cannot say specifically that every one of those changes is due solely to what we've done, but we work in a network of resources and systems, and we think we can lay claim to 
positive changes also means we have to take responsibility when things are moving in the wrong direction, such as obesity rates. Uh, but if we don't have a measure of what we're doing, we don't have any idea of our effectiveness. So evaluating on a continuous basis, often looking at these issues over long periods of time. Uh, many of these health behaviors require a decade or more to see measurable change. Uh, so we're in this for the long term. So 20 years is just a drop in the bucket. We've got at least another 40 to go. Okay. Um, we designed these uh, uh, chanaz as um, a, an area where anyone can be involved. Uh, there's an open invitation. Our, uh, I know our Chanaz meetings are open to anyone to attend. We have elected people, but I think all the Chanaz have an open invitation. And uh, look for key stakeholders. We often invite people that we think need to be at the table. Uh, we do some encouraging of, of those who don't understand what we're doing to uh, get involved with us. Uh, we're also seeking to be reflective of age, racial, ethnic, gender, sexual orientation, and linguistic diversity within our community. That's always a challenge. Okay? We're really talking about groups that often aren't at any table. And getting someone to become involved in a public way sometimes is a, is a real challenge. Uh, but that's what we're seeking to do. Uh, and our partnerships really extend out from the Department of Public Health, which is a key partner, but certainly not the only partner. I think we sometimes do our most effective work when there is not a single professional in the room, when it's made up of community volunteers and their efforts such as what we're doing uh, with Park Advocates, which is a health project creating better outdoor spaces for people. Uh, that, um, that organization is made up entirely of residents of the community. Uh, it's a good example where uh, the, the professional approach is not the best approach. Does that go along with uh, making the easy choice? No, this is making, <laughs> making it's harder sometimes to get people uh, involved at that level. But that's what we seek to do. Um, Ron mentioned funding, and uh, um, I think for many people this is a little confusing. Um, the determination of need process takes place whenever a new facility, a uh, medical facility, is built that exceeds certain um, fiscal requirements. Uh, the numbers keep changing, and I'm not about to uh, uh, say what they are, but uh, we're talking major uh, changes. Uh, uh, if you're going to paint a room, certainly that doesn't kick in a DON. But if you're going to add new services, uh, construct new buildings, uh, locate new facilities, purchase major equipment like MRIs and things of that sort, all of that will trigger uh, the determination of need process to look at an allocation of funds of equal to 5% of the to that total project cost over the course of five years. In other words, 1% of that project per year for a period of five years. That allocation, we had some people visiting us from the Roadmaps Project and they were stunned. They've been all over the country, never heard of something like that. And I, to me, that is a perfect example of how best to fund uh, health promotion. What you're saying is, if your costs of treatment and, and the numbers of people who need treatment are going up, you need to do something more, invest more resources in health promotion. Okay? Otherwise, what happens? The system gets completely out of balance. And, and some people would say that in the United States, it's already out of balance. We're treating far too many people at the wrong end of this process. Um, but it's certainly a start, and it's something where there's a, a correspondence between the expenditure for treatment and the expenditure for health promotion. A unique idea, um, the difficult parts of it are that not every Chana gets funding. It depends on what's happening in your particular region. Uh, we've seen major, if you will, imbalances. We've seen uh, some areas that have gotten 
uh, tens of millions of dollars over a period of time. And some Chinas, I guess, still to this day, have not gotten anything out of this. Uh, there may be a, a few that have gotten very small portions. And, and that's perhaps not the best system, but it's what we have. Every Chana also has the ability to access other funds. So a couple of our Chanas are 501s. We can apply directly for grants. Many others work through a fiscal agent. So if it's a hospital or a Southeast Regional Office, uh, for instance, those are options that people have, uh, that groups have, uh, to look for additional funds. We're certainly not restricted to the DON funding for the projects that we do. And when you talk about partnerships, you're often talking about looking for not only funding, but also collaborative efforts with other organizations. Not if it, Everything does not get done by the people in the room at the Janah meeting. It, it really is a way of organizing the resources for that region. Uh, Chanaz may distribute their funds, as many do, and you'll hear about them in, in just a moment. Uh, you have an opportunity uh, really to re-RFP that money, to, to make that money available for uh, local organizations to apply to do specific projects. That's once your assessment has identified the kinds of things that need to be done, then you can ask community agencies and organizations to step up to the plate, receive some funding, and address those issues. And that's frequently what happens. Um, in Fall River, we've been moving toward a somewhat different model, partly due to the fact that we have uh, predictable uh, funding from uh, DON sources probably for the next six years. Uh, and we're hiring people. I was the first person hired, uh, um, but Marsha uh, Picard standing in the back of the room was the second person. That, uh, Anne Marie and Angie, are you back there somewhere? There you are. There's Anne. Okay. You want to talk to a paid person? Okay, we are staffing. Okay, we have four people right now. Uh, we don't get paid a lot, uh, right, Anne Marie? <laughs> But it's, we manage, and it's, it's, it's a different way of delivering services in the sense that rather than depending on someone deciding uh, to do something that we think needs to be done, we make that decision ourselves uh, within the Chana and uh, then deliver the work through the Chana itself. So there's several ways that Chana's can get things done. Um, so let me uh, be now introduce how we're doing on time. Let me introduce the six Janas here, okay? So you get to know who everybody is. We're going to start uh, with Cape Cod and the Islands, okay? Beverly is here. And with all those people from the Cape and Islands, Jana, please, why don't you stand up? It'll be easier for everybody to see you, okay? <laughs> this is Cape and Islands, wow, all right? So, when you hear about some of the things that uh, we're talking about, these are the people to talk to, okay? Um, <laughs> Cape and Islands is, is one Chanel that works through an RFP process and basically decides what priorities exist in the community that need to be addressed. And then they do two grant cycles a year. Uh, one is a smaller grant cycle and you do several of those. Um, Usually uh, uh, the small grants are about $5,000 and uh, support evidence-based uh, or promising innovative practices to improve primary care. So uh, the categories are elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities. That's, as you recall from what Ron was saying, one of the uh, department's priorities. Uh, promotion of wellness in the home, workplace, school, or community. And prevention and or management of chronic diseases. And um, a number of those initiatives have taken place. They work with schools, small agencies. This is an opportunity for an organization that's probably already doing some things uh, in the area of health promotion, but wants to do a specific project that requires some funding. 5,000 is usually not enough to pay a full-time person, obviously, uh, but it may pay for materials, uh, help promotional uh, information to the community, and make sure that that particular effort is effective. Then, also once a year, you do a larger grant. Um, 
that's offered for up to $40,000, which could pay for at least a part-time person, often does, uh, and that's often a longer-term project, uh, something that may go a year, um, and provides the community an opportunity to really engage in a particular project that will address uh, those same issues, uh, health disparities, promotion of wellness. And um, in the past 27 years, in the past years, Chennai 27 has supported initiatives on youth development, behavioral health, homelessness, uh, access to services, immigrant communities, maternal depression, child care, and a variety of other issues. So uh, there's really no limit within the Chennai. We don't have to wait until some national organization decides that there's some money available to do a particular project. This is very local, and uh, we determine those things at that level. Uh, Fall River, people from the Fall River Chennai, if you could stand up. I know there's a couple of you here. I just introduced you. These are the Fall River folks. Okay. Uh, sure, you can give them a hand. <laughs> just one big round of applause for all the Chennai work that's happening here in the Southeast region. <laughs> As one who's been involved with them since their inception, it's, it's just so gratifying to see not only the audience here today, but the, this presentation that, you know, I, I live and in, in, in work that the Chennai's every day, but to see all those slides and all the great work that's happening, it's, it's truly impressive. And uh, I'll, I'll add that much of this work wouldn't happen if it weren't for the hospitals being at the table. Uh, that's, that's what makes this work. They, they bring not only the determination of need dollars, but they also bring community benefits dollars and their, their wisdom and support to the work of the Chinas. I can't think that all of the Chinas have um, a representative from the hospitals uh, within, their, within their area at the table and not just attending meetings, in most cases rolling up their sleeves, leading a committee, sitting on the steering committee and participating actively in the work of the Chinas. And that's the kind of collaboration that we're here to talk about today is Chinas and other community-based coalitions working collaboratively with hospitals and promoting population health. So again, I, I think this is just a, a, a wonderful presentation that Dave has done, and you also have information in your folder. Andrea reminded me, I didn't ask the New Bedford people to stand up, so they need to stand. So the New Bedford people stand up, <laughs> please. And, and I don't think we got a round of applause for the Cape people, so I think we ought to... <laughs> So, so now it's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce my friend and colleague, Leah Susan Oyama, who, who's the director of the Division of Prevention and Wellness at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, has been with us for, for many years and has been leading uh, our work around mass in motion and community transformation and a number of other things within that division. And so I'll turn the microphone over to her. Uh, after seeing um, some of the work that you're already doing in the Chinaz, I realize some of this is going to be what I talk about it's just reinforcement for the great work that's already happening. But I, um, I thank Ron for inviting me. I, it's hard to step in for Dr. Lauren Smith, but I am happy to, happy to do it. And as we um, all are changing roles at the department, and uh, as Ron said, she does send her regrets, and I'm happy to be here in her place. And I think it is somewhat appropriate also, because you're talking about prevention and wellness, and I, as a director of the Division of Prevention and Wellness, I think what I'm going to share with you is a lot of the work that we're doing in collaboration with a lot of you here in the Southeast that I think that is just showing what the partnerships are, are doing. So I wanted to just start by if you want to, you're talking about the fact that are we out about thinking about what our environments look like? How do we get from here to the next slide to here? And I think it's all of us working to it together in concert. This is already some things that you're already doing here in the Southeast. And it's really important to focus our efforts on creating the conditions that support the behaviors. And it's really like it's getting to this point. So I want to start with a couple frameworks that I like to think about when I'm doing um, talking about prevention work and how we're framing the work at the department. So first, I really like this in the fact that we're trying to get all the way to the right. We're trying to get to the healthy people. But if we don't start all the way to the left, we're not going to get there. And I think that, if you want to just go back just for a second, I, and I think that it's really enforcing the fact that I, it says healthy policy. It's not health policy, okay? I really want to reinforce that because transportation policy is health policy. Housing policy 
is health policy. Education policy is health policy. What we have to do is better embed health and health outcomes and health discussions in the other work that is being done. I mean, what we have in this, in this state that a lot of people don't have as part of, I don't think anybody else in the country has, as part of transportation reform in 2009 was the creation of a healthy transportation compact where it brought together the secretaries of transportation, uh, energy and environmental affairs, uh, house, uh, health and human services, our commissioner of public health, the, the commissioner from Mass Highway and the MBTA, to really talk about what are the interface between land use, transportation, and health outcomes. So again, I have to reinforce this healthy policy to create the healthy environments, to create the healthy behaviors that leads to the healthy people. So next slide. How many people have seen the health impact pyramid? Lots of people, but I think it's again, it's reinfor reinforcing the fact that there's a change in dynamic about how we've been doing our public health work. For a long time, we really focused on the education and the individual counseling and interventions, and we're trying to get the fact that it takes a lot of resources with low low impact to get to to do that. Whereas if we focus on creating the conditions to make the healthy behavior the easy behavior, as you've heard from both Dave and Ron. Um, and changing the context so the default decision is the easy decision. I cut my teeth in tobacco control, in public health doing tobacco control, but we are trying to make it harder to, to smoke. I mean, you know, you made it more inconvenient to smoke, you raised taxes. So I think that's, again, reinforcing the healthy behavior. And I think when we talk about obesity prevention, we're really trying to make it so it is the default behavior is what you're going to do. So next. So again, we've really started by looking at in health, uh, health promotion, really trying to change into a, individual behavior. Next. But why are we, you know, why do we need to change things? You know, knowledge alone does not alter behavior. Because of it's being filmed, to cut this part out, but I talk about the fact that, you know, it's embarrassing sometimes. I know I'm supposed to eat five or more fruits and vegetables a day. I tell you, sometimes it does not happen because, particularly last, uh, yesterday, I don't think I ate very few, many at all, because of just the, the, you know, what my day was like. So, he'll cut that out. That's the disclaimer. So that, that was filmed. The last time I said that, I hope I'm not being filmed when I say this. But I think that the fact that we know that, but then we have to realize that it's what is around us. And um, individual behavior is determined to a large extent by the social environment. So if people have seen the socio-ecological framework before, that it is ultimately our individual, it's our responsibility, what we're going to choose to do and how to be healthy, but we have to realize that the networks we're in, the people we, we are with, the organizations, so the schools we go to, the workplaces that we're in, the communities that we live in, and then the state and the federal regulations as well, this are all going to impact our ability to make those healthy decisions. So this is a society about convenience, right? So we have to figure out how we as, as Ron talks about, that Lauren talks about, is how you can't make that healthy behavior walking uphill in a snowstorm. And this, this winter, we are going to have those snowstorms. Since we didn't last year, right? We've already had them. So next. So this I wanted to just, uh, I have a quote that people have heard me use before, but it's unreasonable to expect that people will change their behavior easily when so many forces in the social, cultural, and physical environments <coughs> conspire against such change. So that came from the Institute of Medicine. I think that's just really reinforces that the work that we're all doing and that we have to make the healthy choice and think about changing the conditions so people can lead healthier lives. So next. So I want to talk, when we talk about areas of activity around prevention, we're really talking about community health where we're really looking at um, strategies to reinforce and support healthy behaviors. We're talking about clinical preventive services and the community clinical linkages, which Ron addressed these early. So I want to talk about, from our perspective, some of the work that we're doing as opportunities for collaboration that, we're, that we see that we're already working with a lot of you in the room on. So I'll talk about our mass in motion and community transformation, population health management, and if I have some time, I'll have talk about our coordinated health promotion and chronic disease plan. So we'll start with mass in motion. Um, so Mass in Motion is a multifaceted campaign that was launched in 2009 um, <clears throat> to, prevent, to prevent overweight and obesity and re really w raise awareness around wellness. So it is a multifaceted campaign and it has some regulatory components. So it has the BMI regulation, it has the school nutrition standards, it has an executive order that the governor signed for all state agencies that procure food. 
um, to follow nutritional standards, and I really think it was very important for the state to take that role, because if we are going to um, have others be changing their conditions, it's really important to role model and make those changes as well, and we serve a lot of food. We have a lot of clients that we serve food to. Um, we have a public information campaign. We've done some we work in child care settings for the mass children that play. There's a working on wellness initiative. But what I want to focus on next, uh, next slide, oh, and these are our campaigns, because I think this is really great to reinforce that it's not about necessarily about going to a gym. It's about getting out and playing in, play, in playgrounds. It's about look, look at, thinking about um, where we can get our local food and healthier food. Next. So I want to talk about the Municipal Wellness and Leadership Grants, because this is something that I do think that there's um, a lot of opportunity for collaboration and partnership and that's happening. So we launched these um, in 2009, and we'll talk about the expansion pretty soon, and then I'll talk about the expansion in a minute. But this is really about creating a partnership at the, at the municipal level, at the community level, to create conditions to support healthier behaviors. And um, next. Our, our funding partners, we started out with some foundations, um, and then it, recent, part, re, the recent funders, in addition, have been Partners Healthcare and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention through the, the, um, the Affordable Care Act money that people talked about, that we have received two community transformation grants that helped us expand. Um, and that's, I mean, that was a highly competitive out of 65, two to come to the, to the state. And then most recently, as you heard, from David, um, congratulations to the Voices for a Healthier South Coast for their small communities grants. CW Springfield also got one, and that's two out of I think it was like 40 or 45. So 40. 40. So again, very impressive, uh, and I think a, uh, a um, reinforcement of the great work that the foundations that have been established here and the work that we're doing to get that. So here we are in our mass and motion communities. We are in 52 cities and towns, representing 33% of the state population. What I think was great about the addition of the community transformation grants, that we were able to add Plymouth, the Barnesville County, the, and both Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket to, a, um, to the Mass Emotion Group that already brought in New Bedford and Fall River from your area were all already part of it, but it is great to see the expansion. So we went from this time last year, 16 communities to we now at 52. So we've had it's a little bit of growing pains, but we're doing great, <laughs> and it's fun. And it's what I think is really important about the new funding is it's taking us into areas that we weren't before. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch how strategies play out on on the Cape, on the islands, in the northern Berkshire County. I mean, that's very different to do some strategies in rural suburban and urban settings. So I think it's going to be a great experience for us to be working with all these guys. And I know I did blue for a little bit, but mass and motion colors are purple, so I, I was afraid if I didn't include mass and motion purple, at one point I, somebody in the room would say, she didn't follow the style guy. <laughs> anyway, Pauline would, would have told on me. So the community's role in municipal wellness and leadership, I really think that the important part was it's to develop a partnership. And we really had wanted the municipality to take a leadership role because if we're really going to work on policy, local policy and environmental change, you have to have this, the city or town government who can make those changes at the table from the get-go. So we really wanted them there in a multifaceted way, but also working with community and community-based um, partners. So we have real leader, diverse leadership, but I think it's been really interesting also to watch where some of these mass emotion programs have been housed on the local level. We have some that are in health departments. We have some that are in community development or planning departments. We have some that are right connected to the mayor. And I think it's very interesting to watch the difference in how they work in their communities and, and with their partners. And it's, a lot has to do with the, what they want to work on and where is the best leverage and where do you get the best, where, what lever do you want to pull. We've also had people do a community assessment. We used to develop, we used a CDC developed tool that really looks at policy and environmental supports. So it's not your traditional community assessment. I think it's more looking at what do you already have and what, what are your assets and what are your needs. And if we want people to be more active, it really starts looking at do you have um, sidewalks <coughs> you know, include, required for new development. And I have thought it's a great educational tool because people go, well, why do I need to know that? 
You need to know that because if you want people to walk or to be more active, you need to have sidewalks and you need the planners and the public works people in your community to understand that they have a role in community health. So I think that our communities have used it. Some, it's not the easiest tool and it's very labor intensive and I think the law, anybody in the room who's done it will tell me that. But I think also people have found it a very useful tool in education and getting partners on board to engage people as well. And the last will be that they have developed a plan. So next. So the focus of our work is really to increase accessibility, availability, affordability, and identification of health of foods and communities. So some of the things that people are working on, I think you're going to hear from Andrea Halloran later, so you'll hear on some work that's going on in the Plymouth. But we're looking at healthy dining programs, looking at healthy corner stores and markets. There are some places where where people are buying their food because they don't have a full service grocery store is the corner stores and neighborhood markets. How can we get healthier food options to them? Looking at increasing use of SNAP and WIC benefits at farmers markets so to give people who are on lower incomes and have the benefit, the ability to go to a farmers market. Looking at zoning, zoning and use of um, vacant lots for community gardens. So again, the thinking about the fact that zoning has to come into play for that. Um, we are having everybody helping support the implementation of the school nutrition standards that went into effect in, in uh, August as the school began. Next. Then we have some work around increasing opportunities for physical activity in communities. So looking at um, Safe Routes to School and really being active Safe Routes to School in addition to doing events to get people walking, really trying to look at identifying schools where you can get significant mode shift, meaning how many kids are in walkable or bikeable distance who are currently being driven to school as opposed to walking or biking, and what can we do to change that? Is it a culture, ch is it culture change? Is it getting people more comfortable with the fact that there, it's safe, is there safety issues? Is there infrastructure issues? Looking at open space and parks, like making sure that what we have it stays open and doesn't always get built up. And then also the parks that we have, are people using them? Are they clean? Is there concerns about crime and safety? So really making public safety decisions to get, get people more active. Looking at uh, snow clearance. You know, as I said, joked. Last year we didn't really have to worry about snow. But in a state like Massachusetts in the Northeast, you know, we have issues with snow and ice. And if people cannot walk safely on their sidewalks, but they're not going to use them. So how are we, how are we addressing that? So next. And also, to what we also are working on changing the condition through policy and local decision about healthy community design. So looking at complete streets policy. So the fact that complete streets policy means that you design a road for all users. We typically have designed for cars and figured everybody else out, right? This is the philosophy if you design from the outside in. So think about the fact any user, a walker, somebody who's walking, somebody who's biking, somebody who's pushing a stroller, somebody who might be in a wheelchair, and an automobile, and a person riding public transit. So it's really looking at every user and designing streets that way. So we have it in the state guide to do that, but we don't have um, all local roads are not done that way. So we have a lot of communities working on that. Looking at establishing healthy design standards for new development. So when we do development and we build, let's build in ways that we know is going to be more healthy. You know, making sure things are connected. Don't isolate um, buildings away from something that they could walk to, to put that into place. Um, incorporating health element into municipal plans. So really thinking about each city or town is required every 10 years to do a comprehensive plan, and that's what they want to look like. How do we embed health into those discussions? As somebody who used to be on a board of health, I'm not. I finally stepped down. I will say that when we got plans, if, if boards of health look at development plans at all, they usually look at water and sewer. What we're trying to encourage boards of health to do is to more actively look at um, active design standards, looking at um, lighting, looking at uh, do they have sidewalks, to so really be more proactive in how our, our communities are being designed. And I will say that as someone who's done a lot of this work over the last couple of years, our, our colleagues in land use and transportation planning are there are more there than our, we have to push our colleagues in public health to really understand the role that zoning plays and that healthy design plays. So it's great that you're all here and you can all help do that in your own cities and towns. So next. So next I'm going to switch on to the 
the other, another part of the work that we're doing is really this the linking of the clinical and the community setting through a population health management initiative. And our, my colleague at the department, Patty Daly, is, is leading this for us. And you're, you were overbooked, so she couldn't even come today, but, which is great for you. But then I can't point her out to you. But Graham Vegan can get in touch because she's, <laughs> she's involved in this as well. But, so the work that we're doing is to really improve the clinical outcomes. So really thinking about if we want a comprehensive system and if we're in this time of cost containment, we really want to make sure that the care that we're providing, particularly around chronic disease prevention, is effective care and that we're linking people to the resources that they need. So the focus is on increasing the overall effectiveness of health promotion efforts, in both at the clinical and community sites, by expanding monitoring clinical data reporting systems to improve the quality and routine use of effective clinical and other preventive services through system change, and creating and enhancing linkages between municipal wellness mass emotion initiatives and, and clinical services. So this is three major strategies. They're going to be using de-identified data from the electronic health record to identify for improvement in equities in care, as well as to measure successful interventions, creating a network to support quality improvement champions, sharing best practices, and creating and or strengthening community clinical linkages. Okay. So the pilot sites that we're working on in the southeast, as part of the community transformation clinical component, we're working with Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, Harbor Community Health Center in Hyannis, and the Outer Cape Community Health Center. And then we're also, um, separate from the, from the community transformation, we've been working with the South Coast Physicians Network. And I think that was actually the first pilot that, that we've been able to expand and work more collaboratively with the community health centers. Next. So the first component is that the use of the, the Data from the e-health record allows the provider to change focus to an impact group of individuals rather just than the patient sitting in front of them. This population health approach is a new way of approaching care for many providers. It looks at the health outcomes of groups of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. And we're developing a systems approach to ensure that the best care is delivered to every patient at every visit. And then the de department will use the data from the EMR to create feedback reports that will benchmark providers against state and national be benchmarks as well as compare to other providers in their practice settings. So it's giving us data that then we're working with to give back and feedback. The next part of it will be that it's not important just to give the feedback, we also want to do QI coaching. So the practice teams will re receive quality improvement coaching to develop improvement plans and measure small tests of change which has impact on outcomes. So really then also have them all working in concert with each other across the state. So I talked about the four pilots that are here, but we have three other sites that we're working with um, as part of the Middlesex Community Transformation. Next. And the last part is really enhancing the linkages. So to really look at, um, so we know that successful population-based care requires that staff not only you know the resources beyond the, the, the room that they're in with their patient. They, need, they can talk with their patient, but they need to know what's out there and that they can refer to. And it's really important to know those resources. So what we're working on is next is creating a community prescription. And this is just a mock-up. It's not a real thing yet. So anybody who's in those areas, it's not, it's not done. This is just an example. But the work will be to work with the hospital or the physician group or the community health center to work with their the resources in their communities to develop a, a community prescription. And initially, this will be paper-based, and we'll work with the agencies to track receiving referrals. So you'll see in this particular example, it's just you know, on one part of it will be what's the, you know, the, some of the, the blood pressure, cholesterol, weight, A1C, and the tobacco use, and then they're referring them to resources that, that are out in the community for them. And the goal is to, this is paper-based now, but the goal is to try to get this electronic so then you'll have a referral back to the physician around what the use, is, the use has been. So the, for the communities that are working, as I talked in the pilot sites, this is something that as it moves forward, you will have the ability to, to say that we're, we're a resource in our, in, your, in our community that we want to be part of that. If you're not part of the pilot, this is something that you could, rep I would think that you could replicate yourself in working between the clinical and the community setting to look at this. And again, this is, has things like the farmer's market, has lifestyle coaching, it has the 1-800 number for the, quit, the smoke free quit, the tobacco quit line. So next. So the other part I think that we also often talk about in the clinical community linkages, it's we often focus on how do we link patients 
to refer resources in the community. What I want to talk a little bit about as well is how do we engage healthcare providers in the whole community change process. And again, I think that what, you know, Andrea's example in, in Plymouth is going to be a good example of where the hospital has really been a strong leader in looking for changes in Plymouth. But I think it's important to talk, think about the fact that there is the power of the white coat. You know, and it's important for, you know, the doctors to talk about the medical, the reasons why we want to do things. And I don't want to just say physicians, physician assistants. I think that the community health workers we talked about, you know, you talked about before, again, are really good advocates for the community and why the community needs certain things. The other part of it is, well, well what do we do? Have them provide educational information. You know, get people on local boards or commissions. I was at a conference a couple of years ago with a physician who happened to sit on his local board of health, and it was about policy change, and what he was thinking, we have to go back and ban trans fat. And they have banned 100% trans fat in the, in the city of Chelsea. You know, so he did that. I mean, he thought of the fact what that meant for his patients. And because he sat on a local board of health, he was able to take that step and really bring that. So to think about that. Have people meeting at local officials, testifying at hearings, and really working as part of the community team. I think it's important for us who are working in community health and community partnerships to think about when you want to engage the health care provider. Because I think, is it the best use of the, that champion to come sit at a meeting? I think that would be great. But if you're going to be able to engage them in a minimal time, do you want to instead help prep them for a city council hearing or, or a planning board? I was at a conference in the spring on health impact assessments, and there was a pediatrician who was talking about some work she did in Baltimore and she said, okay, here I am a pediatrician talking about zoning change. So, you know, apologize. And I wanted to say I think it's wonderful that a pediatrician was talking about zoning changes regarding alcohol, um, where alcohol was sold in the city of Baltimore. So I think it's with how do we want to engage the healthcare community in the decisions so to think really effectively about that, what's the best use. And I, I go back to, again to my tobacco control days that when the city of Worcester was working on, this is before we had our statewide smoke-free workplace law, when the city of Worcester was working on their local regs, one of the most powerful ad campaigns we have came from the Worcester District Medical Society, them talking about what it would mean for their patients to have a smoke-free environment. So again, we, we need to work to engage. Next. So the last thing I want to talk about before I got to the trust, because I know everybody's <laughs> interested in the trust as well, is the Mass Chronic Disease Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Plan. Because I think this is another opportunity of collaboration. So the, in the past, the CDC has funded us to do a diabetes plan, a healthy obesity plan, a healthy weight plan, a heart disease and stroke plan. And those of you in the community have kept saying to people like me, when are you going to do one that brings it all together? Well, the CDC has finally heard you. And the CDC has charged us with creating a Massachusetts a chronic disease and a health promotion plan that's a collaboration amongst all these issues to really address the issues together. So the goals are really broad based. It's not just around heart disease and stroke. It's around asthma. It's around arthritis. It's around obesity. It's around diabetes. It's around um, obesity. Did I say obesity? It's around cancer. So we have established goals that are really cross-cutting goals that then we're going to do work towards next. So what, how we have formed, we have about 90 partners currently working with us, and this is not our, it's not the department's plan, it is the state's plan around chronic disease prevention. And I think there's many people in this room who've been participating in our communities of practice. And what we did with that group was we have 17 goals that now we have flushed down to um, 11, seven communities of practice, and it's people working around activities, and it's not creating new activities. It's really synergizing the work that's already happening across the state that we're going to work more collaboratively, collaboratively together. I can say that word. It's not a big word, but we <laughs> work more collaboratively together. And I think another, again, it's a perfect example of some of the work that you're, you know, thinking you're doing today is around partnering and how you work in concert with each other. So for us with this plan, it's not about doing new work. It's about working with partners that maybe have not been connected before. So our areas are really looking at healthy eating, and this is looking at fruit and vegetable consumption, so doing strategies around that. Physical activity with a real focus on physical activity levels, so they're looking at both in school and out of school time and getting kids more active. 
Our built environment group is getting, looking at getting local complete streets policy. So as I say, starting to design on the local level. We have a tobacco-free living group that is looking at smoke-free homes. The clinical preventive services and population health management group is right now focused on blood pressure and tobacco. They had a long list of objectives that included um, flu and cholesterol. And, um, so they're really trying to prioritize right now for the work around blood pressure and tobacco. And then community and clinical linkages is really looking at those best practice models that we, you know, uh, Ron was talking about earlier, looking at chronic disease self-management programs, looking at the use of community health workers, looking at the role pharmacists play in making the link between community and clinical setting. And then our final group is looking at improved access to data, and state and local data. So how do we have data that we can get out and that you can more you can use to do the work that you want to do? Sometimes it's that the data that we're able to produce is not produced in the way that makes it most helpful for communities to use. So we're really trying to create community level or community reports that we can share. Now, this is probably really why I was invited, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> is to talk about chapter 224, as we call it, is improving the quality of health care and reducing costs. So the state has a is chapter 224 is all of the cost containment. The fact that what we're trying to, all of cost containment is looking at is to make sure that we're containing costs, that it's not going beyond what the gross increase in, in did you find it for me? Keep talking, I'll find it. You're not remembering that part too. So it's really trying to retain costs at not more than, so we're not increasing health care costs at more than like 3.5%. So we really are trying to make sure that we're, if you're containing costs, things go up. We know that things go up, but what the cost containment is, is that you're trying to keep cost, health care costs down below what the average gross increase is. That is it. So what we're trying, sorry, is the annual increase increase in total health care spending not to exceed economic growth. And so it's growth of, in 2013, equals 3.6%. So I came pretty close to remember it. So this is multiple parts of multiple parts of state government working on cost containment. So what I want to focus on next, next slide, is really just the, the Department of Public Health's responsibilities related to prevention and wellness. So the department, in addition to the responsibilities that are coming out of my Bureau of Community Health and Prevention, where I sit, our Bureau of Healthcare, Qual Healthcare Quality and Safety is also has quite a few responsibility as well. But I'm going to focus on what we're doing in our Bureau. So the first is that we're there's establishing a wellness tax credit worth 25% of the costs of implementing a wellness program, so up to $10,000 per year for business, small businesses. And the small business is still being defined of what do we exactly mean. And some of us were at a public, here, a public information session the other day where we were getting some great information from small businesses about about that. But this gives the ability for a, small, a smaller, smaller business as they're implementing a wellness program to get a 10%, uh, to get a 10, 25% or 10, up to $10,000 tax credit in the following year. And the role of DP, the DPH role is to create the seal of approval for what would be approved as a certified um, wellness program. DOR, our, our Department of Revenue, is responsible for giving the credit. But so the department, through regulation, is working on creating the seal of approval and how that will go into effect. So that needs to, it's for tax year 2013. So it should be, if it doesn't hit the Public Health Council in December, it is going to be in early January. So then the businesses will know what they need to be doing in order to qualify for the tax credit when they file their taxes in 2014. And then we're also working in consultation with the Division of Insurance and in creating a model uh, wellness guide um, for employers, payers, and consumers. So this will also be a web-based resource for, for all work sites who want to do wellness programs. Next and the last is the Prevention and Wellness Trust Fund. So this creates a Prevention and Wellness Trust Fund and provides $15 million per year for over four years, so for the total of $60 million. The fund are to be used to support the state's cost containment goals. So again, it goes back to that 3.6. We have to be doing work that is going to help contain those health care costs that we talked about. It will be awarded in a competitive award process. So it's, it's expected that the monies will be in place because of how the payments are going to be made by the end of June. So what we're working on is the creation of the procurement that would go out 
this point, whether it's late spring, it could be spring, it could be early summer. It depends. The, the, the timing of getting that you have to get the money in first before we can make procurement. So that will be something that will be worked on. And again, it's really important the fact that it's going to focus on containing costs. And it's focused on, there's in, right in the legislation, it talks about who's eligible. And maybe Maddie's going to talk about more about this as well. But it's municipalities. It's, it's, it's regional planning agencies in, in conjunction with municipalities. It's ACOs working with uh, um, municipalities. I think it's really clear that communities and municipalities are a key component of all the work that's going to be done. It's community-based agencies. So that is going to be, as I say, something to look for come you know, late spring, uh, late spring, depending on the timing. But there will be, I'm sure, lots that goes out. The other part that has to happen before we can even do the, the procurement is the formation of a, a, a prevention and wellness advisory council to guide the decisions and, the, and the evaluate the outcomes. Right now, all recommendations, they were actually very clear in the legislation, the, the representative, the seats, per se, that you, needed, that you needed to fill. So there were recommendations that have been made to the governor's office that is under review right now. The nominations have been made, and it's, it's hoped or expected that probably early in the next calendar year, we will have that council appointed so they can meet to really start the process of guiding what the procurement and what this will look like. And as I say, I think Maddie's going to talk more about the whole development of the trust and really the role that a lot of people played in, in making sure this prevention and wellness trust exists. Because I think that's really what's key is that fact that prevention is included in cost containment. Because I think it's really important, like as you started off with like your health care card does not necessarily mean, you know, I think a lot of us who work in prevention have seen things change since we've had health care reform. And now it's national. So we're thinking, this is, I think, a very good sign that some of you in this room were really very successful in getting prevention language in working around cost containment. So I think that that's really important. And I think that's it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, um, I'm Angela Grass. I'm the Workstate Wellness Coordinator for Partners for a Healthier Community at Fall River. My question is regarding the 25% to the small businesses for the Workstate Wellness Program. Is it known yet if there's going to be monies asked from the small businesses um, to be put on the table first in order to uh, require a wellness program up front and then the state health or we know? So what, what will happen is, is that, and that will all be part of the sort of the certification process, is that it will be eligible, there will be eligible costs based on their, the program they put together that, that's then eligible for the tax credit. So they will have to have done the whole program and then apply for the tax credit afterwards. We're not giving money, the state is not providing money to do the program. It's the investment of the small business to do the to do the program, and then they benefit by getting a tax, the tax credit in the following year. And there will be definition of what are eligible costs as part of the criteria. How do you define small business? Well, that's that's why I say that's okay. that's that's still, and that's going to be part of the regulation okay. because there has been it started at 50, and it was started and it went into 100. I think it may based on some. There was a listening session the other day where we really were getting some feedback on small businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, and what the numbers, and I think what's challenging is that there is evidence, a lot of evidence around worksite wellness for large, medium and large, and there isn't a lot for, and, and in, in this legislation, you, it can, you can qualify as a sole proprietor. Tell, tell me, we're having struggling with how do you, you know, in that, what do you say that's eligible? So I, I think it, it's, it's, it's still coming. to be determined, it's, it's coming, sticky. <laughs> it's sticky, it's sticky, but as I say, it's changed. Yes, Val? Um, and there's such great work going on locally and statewide, but I notice that it, uh, it crosses a wide variety of issues. So all the Chanaz are working on a range of things. They need to be responsive locally. But we also have these statewide goals around saving costs, the chronic disease prevention plan. What are you thinking about at DPH about how to um, guide local efforts, Chanaz, DON, and uh, community benefits? towards more united efforts towards the same goals? 
That's a really good question. Um, and I think that there has been some start with that, with the change in how the some of the um, the DON funding with the, the the DPH priorities. But I think that given some of the other work, is could that be expanded? Because I think it's really important. And we see that a lot of what we are, are benchmarking for the state is going to start, it starts local, and it's the influence, it's the work that's being done is going to really be driving and get to that. But I think that's a really good point that Ron and I can bring back about how do we ex further expand some of that going, you know, we have the DPH priorities as one starting point, and let's start to think about with Chapter 224 and cost containment and some of the other work that's now coming out through um, the co coordinated chronic disease plan as well. So thanks, Val, for that. Yeah, do you want to add to that? Well, when we, when we developed the, the guidelines for the Determination of Need program in 2008, we addressed three of the department's priorities, uh, managing chronic disease, health disparities, and promoting wellness. We, we did not include um, supporting uh, the successful implementation of health care reform uh, when we did that. Uh, but now I, I think it's, it's a good point to make that supporting the success of health care reform as it's currently constructed, uh, prevention is a key part of that. And we may want to more deliberately incorporate that into the work of the Chinaz and into the DON work. So that's a, a useful comment to bring back. that we're even being more specific with our mass and motion communities now about really thinking about um, broad, the, the broad-based strategies. And at the beginning, I think it was very much, we want you to do something in healthy eating and active living. But now we're really looking at the evidence. And if we I mean, have a goal of 5% reduction in obesity, you really need a very broad-based strategy. So we're really fine-tuning the, the selection that still I feel strongly that still it needs to be a community decision on what they're going to work on because we have 351 communities that are all very different so how what they want to focus on needs to still be a community decision but we want to fine-tune that. The other thing I was going to say is that I think that a lot of times it's also how do people use other things that have been established like I think for example the national prevention strategy that has been established you aren't seeing a lot what's happening nationally about how that's slowing down. But I think the work on the ground is really what's happening in our communities, because the National Prevention Strategy is bringing the, you know, the executive offices on housing and transportation and how, you know, how it all together. And do we see something, a result of that? I don't, I don't know, truthfully. But those of you who are doing it on the ground are doing the same thing and a little bit differently, and you're seeing you know, progress. So I think that you take some of the stuff that's done nationally or is at the state and how you implement and roll it out on the local level is really important. Because I think there's lessons that then go up to those of us who are working at those other levels. Yes, Dave? I was very interested in uh, the project that you're working on in terms of uh, having physicians write prescriptions to community resources. Do you have in mind uh, some kind of tracking system or communication back and forth, or do you just send people out? Because uh, we're very interested in doing that and have been talking with physicians about that. But one of the questions is, how does the physician know that someone arrived at the other end? Paper, and it's in it's, and it's all um, you know, paper and going and then working on the system back. But the hope is to get it all electronic and to work with community-based organizations that have the ability to make that happen and get that back. Because I think that Quit Works and the tobacco has, was a great example of how that's important because they did the electronic or it was paper referral, but they still got feedback or they get feedback around if their patients contacted the Quit line or if they took you know, advantage of the services. So I think that's important for a physician as opposed to say, you know, go to the Y or go exercise and not get that bad. But I want to piggyback on that. Yeah. How about the economic barriers? I mean, it is cute, it's nice. The Y costs money, okay? I saw that as an option. Farmers markets typically close at 6 o'clock at night. People work. I mean, how do you really follow up and implement it? 
because there are some things many of us would like to do and many people in the South Coast would like to do, but the time or the economics right. is preventing that to happen, and that's real. Right, that is real, and I think that that's why um, you saw why up there, but you also saw like where the Department of Conservation and Recreation lands are. I mean, that's why we do a both of. But then you need a car. We talk. We talk physical yeah. activity, and that's where the transportation. Yeah. You know, that's why it's all interconnected. Because you're absolutely right. But we talk physical activity. We don't talk exercise because we really feel strongly that. It is about getting activity. And is it for people who can get to the gym and have either the time and resources to do it, or how do we build in activity into everyday life, whether it be walking to school, people who use transit, people who are you know, doing shopping. It, and it is a very valid point. And that's why they're also the work around the park improvements. I mean, we have places that we have great resources in the communities, but they're not being used for various reasons, whether it be maintenance issues, whether it be concerns about crime and you know violence, so it's people making those types of strategies and changes to really get people back to being able to use those. But they're very valid points, and I think that that's something when we're talking about the prescription that's really important to focus on. And that's why I also say that it's not all about just connecting to the resources; it is about engaging the healthcare providers and changing the conditions that they're their residents live in. Mm -hmm. I have my one minute warning. One question over there. You had a question? My, my, my comment was this, just addressed. Basically, I was just going to say that I think that the prescriptions, you know, for, for a life coach for smoking cessation, uh. for the YMCA and the YWCA, for the farmer's market are all wonderful suggestions. But I work in low-income housing. And I can honestly say that unless Mass Health or, or an HMO provider is going to pay for those mm -hmm. things, they are absolutely not going to be addressed. And my other problem, because I've never, I, Fall River is fantastic with having all kinds of nonprofit service provider agencies available to address just about any type of issue anyone could have. And my, my apartment building has 200 apartments. So we address the entire rainbow of issues, but I can't get them anywhere. And because these, a lot of these people are elderly, they're there for a reason, they're on social security, disability, I can't get them anywhere. There's no transportation for anything. So I think that's a very great point. I, uh, yeah, uh, I showed you the four, the four pilot sites that we're working on. If any of you are in those areas, so in the four, either the three community health centers or in that South Coast group, I think it would be really important as we're working on that, because as it said, it's going to be working with the community partners about what that looks like. So if you're in those four, but if, to, to, base, to really it would be important to outreach, but if you're not, I think it would still be very helpful for us, and I, I can give you my card and get you in touch with Patty, and, I, and Bree, who's been working on the project, is, is nodding her head as well, that I think to get some input from some of you who are bringing, raising the, is, these issues to the group that's working on the design, I think would be very helpful. So again, two things, if you're in those four, to really, as this rolls out in those community health centers, to do that. I'm getting this zero with a smiling face on it. I don't know why it doesn't have a frown. Just one more thing, really quick. Yeah, I'm going to be here for a little bit, so if you want to sit, yeah, okay, go ahead. Really important to me is that there is, when you talk about ordinance, I think that sometimes in order to affect change, you have to start with an ordinance. And I know in my 200 building apartment, a lot of the people there are sick. They've got COPD, they've got asthma, and there is no law or ordinance or rule saying that anything that is funded by the state or a federal government in terms of housing needs to be smoke free. Yeah. And that needs to happen. I mean, I think it's that's the work that's being done. There's local work being done, but what the department is working on is, is working again with our sister agency, Housing and Community Development, to have those conversations. We already know that HUD, from the federal level, is supportive of smoke-free housing. So it's really, we are working on making those, changing those, is working with our counterparts to make sure that that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we got the diabetes. Yeah. Uh,
Our speaker, our first speaker, now this is a, this is a great part of today's program that uh, the, the committee really thought was very helpful, which was to get, uh, to invite the hospitals in the southeast region to talk about some successful collaborative efforts that they, they have been involved in uh, with, with their partners in the community. We also invited community health centers to be part of that. And just a quick plug, I know I, I praise the work of, of hospitals in collaboration with community health networks. And I, I neglected, I know there are many partners with community health networks, but I know the community health centers in the southeast region have a strong contingent of community health workers and they're very actively engaged in the work of the Chinese. I just wanted to in particular acknowledge that. Our uh, speaker now is Andrea Holloran, who's the Vice President for External Affairs at Jordan Health Systems, and she's going to talk about uh, the Healthy Plunk Initiative. That's right. Okay, here you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I just whispered to Ron that all the hubbub um, of everybody settling down reminds me of when I give my kids sugar-sweetened beverages. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, again, I'm Andrea Holloran, Vice President of External Affairs at Jordan Health Systems. And what I'd like to talk with you today about is our Healthy Plymouth initiative. Healthy Plymouth, now branded Healthy Plymouth, was a healthy communities initiative that actually began back in 2010, or 2011, with some informal conversations in our community. Uh, Peter Holden, who's the CEO at Jordan Health Systems, was uh, terrific about looking at the strategic plan and stepping back and saying, it's time for hospitals to look at their role in the community differently. We've always been focused on the acute care episode and taking great care of patients that are acutely ill. But we need to be worrying about population health, about people being healthy before they get sick, so that hopefully we won't see as many of those patients coming into the hospital. This is a pretty significant statement for a hospital CEO to make. Because as you all know, hospitals are reimbursed based on how many patients they see and how many tests they perform. So to declare publicly and to make a decision to modify the strategy of the organization to focus on population health is a, a significant change and a significant commitment by our CEO. Um, but he really believes in doing the right thing, and this is the right thing to do. So all of the folks that have been in the prevention world for many years um, that have worked in our community, I think, are very excited about the fact that we're playing a role in this now that we just weren't able to play before. So um, as a part of that, then, and the strategic plan that I talked with you about that Jordan has now um, embraced, looks at better health, better health care, and better value, the triple aim. But better health, being population health, is the area that I'm responsible for at Jordan. So not only did Peter make a decision to look differently at the strategy of the organization, but he dedicated one vice president from his team to be fo solely focused on population health, which is a pretty significant commitment of resources for um, a community hospital to make. So if Peter were in the room, I'd watch the platform. Kudos to him. I'll transport that back to him. Um, so again, how did we begin this work? We, we, I recognized that this was going to be um, an important focus for us. Uh, so we began having conversations with folks in the community, just informal conversations talking about um, what are the issues in the community and how can we help improve the health of the greater Plymouth population. So those informal conversations with many key leaders in the community resulted in a message back to us that said, we're really excited that you're getting out of the four walls of the hospital. We're really excited that you're willing to focus on this and to work with us. But um, what we think is a couple of things. We think that there needs to be more people in the room having this conversation together. And actually, we'd like you to take the lead role in this because there are a lot of people in this community working on a lot of important initiatives, but we really need it sort of pulled together. We need some glue around this, and that's the role that we'd like to see you play. So we then convened um, a large group of people in a room here at the Radisson Hotel in June of 2011, and we called it the Healthy Community Summit. So we asked lots of folks from all different walks of life in the, um, in the community to come together. We had leaders from the school system. We had um, all the municipal leaders. We had legislators. We had um, health and human service agencies, people that led community groups, um, people from the local, the local transportation system, 
Um, we have the media, actually. We had a report from the old Colony Memorial that came and embedded himself in the summit that day to sort of experience the summit and to be able to report on it and talk about what, what that was like, what we covered. And I don't know if any of you know Mark Fenton. Mark Fenton, not a nod. Is Mark Fenton great? He is so engaging and exciting. We actually were able to get Mark Fenton to come and join us that day. He facilitated that day. So to try to give you a picture of the energy in the room that day, when Mark's in a room, there's energy in the room. So he did a great job of um, talking about, first, what does it mean to be a healthier community and what are the important things that we should be looking at and focusing on and then putting everybody into breakout groups to talk more specifically about some of the issues um, at play in the greater Plymouth community. Right around the same time that that was happening, the Department of Public Health issued a uh, community transformation grant opportunity for us to be able to apply for. So again, in working very closely with the town of Plymouth, um, they said we would love to be able to apply for that. Um, let's partner up and do that. So we went ahead and applied for that and were able to um, help the town of Plymouth receive designation as a mass in motion community and be able to get the funds that help make this work that we're doing in the community now happen. So um, kudos to the town of Plymouth because they stepped up and um, wanted to go ahead and make that commitment. And as you know, for those of you that are mass in motion communities, that's a significant commitment. There are measurable objectives that you need to achieve over a three-year period of time, and um, you have to you know, be willing to do that. And you, know, you have to know that you have the support and the manpower and the resources in your community to be able to commit to that. So um, that was really a terrific thing. And I, I think it, I want to make a note when, as I talk about this relationship with the town of Plymouth to something, harken back to something that Leah said when she was speaking this morning. And she talked about mass in motion communities and how they are typically um, rooted in the municipality, in some department, in various different departments in the municipality. And for us in this community, it's a different model. And we thank the department for supporting that because initially when we were having conversations about, well, um, the hospital would like to take the lead role, we really had to talk that through and say, is this going to be a sustainable initiative in the community without it really being embedded, um, the resource embedded in the town of Plymouth, but in fact embedded in the hospital. It was somewhat different than I think what you've seen in the department, but they were you know, completely supportive of us being willing to do this. So um, it's worked out well for us. And I think that's another important point is, what works in your community? You have to figure out what works in your community. And in this community, that's what made sense. So the hospital is um, happy and excited to be able to play a facilitating role and to, to work with the town on the um, community transformation grant objectives. And for us, um, the objectives are around, of course, healthy eating and active living. So we have committed to um, a healthy corner market objective and to working with the school system to adopt, of course, the school nutrition ranks. Um, we're looking at a complete streets objective and a safe routes to school objective. And actually, I just got an email yesterday about safe routes to school that um, we have our third school in Plymouth enrolled in safe routes to schools. Now we're at 50%, of, so 50% of the schools in Plymouth are enrolled. And, um, uh, we believe that we'll be able to get the other schools enrolled too, but that was an exciting piece of information to get right before I came here. So um, we're, we're embarking on some great work. Um, so what else do I want to tell you about our relationship? We have been working on all of those measurable objectives um, with the help of the nutritionists at Jordan Hospital, and I know uh, Carol Burns is sitting here in the room, um, and Deb Shepherdly from the marketing department at Jordan, they've done a tremendous job. Um, and to sort of tell you about what are some of the work that we've done in those objectives, um, the community nutrition objective has been something that we are working closely with the Department of Health, Public Health on as we identify what is the criteria that can allow a healthy corner market to be called a healthy corner market. But we've gone out and talked with all of the corner markets, we've surveyed them, we've begun to build those relationships, and we're at the early stages of being able to um, to be able to create the sort of um, structure inside of a market that can let them be labeled and called a healthy corner market and be able to celebrate that success. So that's an, an initiative that's underway. But one of the other things that we are 
working on that is um, really, I think, again, kudos to the town of Plymouth, is the school adoption of the school nutrition regs. Marsha Carroll, from the nutritionist from Jordan, sat down with the director of food services at the Plymouth Public Schools, all set to sort of explain, well, you know about these nutrition regs, and we're here to help you adopt them, only to learn that the director of food service, another call out to Patrick Van Cock, the director of food services, was so far along in the food that he was providing to the Plymouth Public Schools, he was already um, getting, um, having a salad bar, he had 33% of the kids eating from the salad bar, he already had lean uh, meats, he was already using whole grains in his, um, in his foods, he was doing a tremendous job. So one of the things that we've learned from this work is that we want to make sure that the people in the community know all the work that Patrick has been doing over the years and that he gets credit for that and that we can celebrate his success while we continue to move forward and adopt the rest of the regs that need to be adopted. But um, if you have a child in the Plymouth School System, you can feel good about the fact that the food at the Plymouth Public Schools is maybe healthier than, than you might think. One of the things I think um, that Patrick talked about, actually, is the reluctance to label the school menu as such and to be able to talk about how healthy the food is because he's afraid that the kids won't choose it <laughs> <laughs> if they know that it's health, as healthy as it is. So, um, so that work is underway and we're doing um, uh, uh, making great strides there. One of the other things that we're doing is um, education in the school systems. Um, again, Marsha and Carol are going out into the school systems and they've been running education programs, nutrition programs, to the students as part of the <coughs> curriculum in the schools. And then the students turn and teach the parents about the nutrition. Um, so that's been uh, really a, a great initiative. And um, another important initiative that I want to highlight is that Marsha and Carol have developed a cookbook a cookbook of vegetable recipes that I think you might have all had. Did those get passed out? Isn't that beautiful? They did a great job. Uh, all uh, vegetable recipes. So for those of us that want to eat vegetables and think, I don't know what that is, Carol actually, funny story, found, um, I think it was leeks, and she put them on the windshield of my car with a note that said, guess what this is? So it was fun that my girls and I had trying to figure out what that was and then what we could do with it. So. But the vegetable cookbook has been um, a big accomplishment, something that we're very proud of. It's really done nicely, and we're getting that out to the folks in the community. So we're getting that out to the, uh, at the farmer's market and all the community events that we can get that to. We're getting that out to the parents. We're trying to get that information out there to people so that that's just another resource, another educational uh, tool, another piece of information for people to be able to have uh, to be able to, uh, to prepare healthy foods. Another um, sort of uh, bullet on the slide here that I want to talk about is, and this is summit number two. So I told you that we had a, a summit um, back in uh, June, and that was when we had everybody come together to talk about what we could do in the town of Plymouth, and then we've been working on those objectives. But we had a second summit just a couple of weeks ago, and the really great thing about that summit was how that summit came to be. The first summit that we held was me saying, we need to get all these people in the room because they because the people that we've talked to have asked for a broader conversation and asked for us to take a lead role. But what's significant about this summit is that the town of Plymouth said, we need to get another summit together. We need to get some more folks in the room and talk about all the work that's been going on because there's a lot of work that's going on. They called Plymouth Plantation and said, you probably know what's going on, but let me update you. And Plymouth Plantation said, we definitely want to be a part of that. And in fact, we house the farmer's market. So let's make sure that when we have that summit, you have it here, and we'll have it on the day that we have the farmer's market so that we can end this um, exchange of information, this update of information, on a day where we can then drive people to the farmer's market where we have the healthy cookbooks available to people so that they could grab a cookbook and then grab some free vegetables because the hospital um, made a purchase at the farmer's market and had a big array of free vegetables available to people to be able to just take with them that day. Um, so it, I guess the point here is the illustration of the partnership, where we began with the hospital saying, okay, well, we'll take the lead role in five minutes, thanks, and we'll go ahead and um, get everybody together. The momentum is building now where other people in the community are, are reaching out and stepping up and saying, um, we want to be able to uh, get something else going. And it's not necessarily just me driving it, which is, I think, the whole point of today's conference is about collaboration and partnerships. So um, 
I think that's pretty significant. Um, just in terms of the work that we're doing, there's one other point that I want to leave you with about complete streets and um, secrets to school. The town of Plymouth has been working diligently on making some of these changes and in mm -hmm. fact are drafting a complete streets policy right now um, that they expect to be adopted by the Board of Selectmen. So nobody has a lot of funding to be able to go back and put sidewalks on every street, but their goal is every time they touch a street on a go-forward basis to have healthy criteria and to look at that street and say, how can we improve that street so it's more walkable and bikeable? And in fact, the first complete street in Plymouth is the one right in front of Jordan Hospital. It's Obery Street. It's now striped and it has sharrows. That's a new term that I learned. It's those little arrows that have like a bike person on them. And it's supposed to cue drivers that say, be careful because there could be a biker on the street along with you. Um, so the first complete street is Obery Street and they actually have three other streets targeted for complete streets that are going to be coming up shortly. That would be for folks that live in the area. Samoset Street, um, Taylor Ave, and there's one more I forgot. But three streets anyway, with a second phase to Obery Street where they're going to be talking about sidewalking Obery Street and some roundabouts and some other exciting things that will make that more walkable. We're excited about the nook of Obery Street where the hospital resides. The Plymouth, new Plymouth North High School is right across the street. The Council on Aging is, is opening in December there. So we're excited about some collaboration opportunities that we're talking about that can all happen as a result of those three important entities that are all going to be co-located in the same area. So um, there's a really a lot of good things happening in Plymouth, and I think, again, the important point is while the hospital is taking the lead role because they were asked to, it's really become a community-sustained effort. And, um, you know, I can't say enough about the people that I've had the opportunity to meet and work with and how exciting this work has been. So I see that I'm getting the sign, so I'm just going to ask if anybody has any questions. Does Plymouth have a newspaper, and if so, did they help with the campaign of getting the word out? Yes, I think I just touched on that, but they, the newspaper in Plymouth, the weekly, it's actually twice a week, is called the Old Colony Memorial, and the reporter that um, embedded himself in the first summit came to the second summit um, and spent the entire day there at the second summit and was actually very excited to hear about the updates and said to me, what I'd like to do is to take the pieces of the work that you're doing and profile one piece at a time so it's not just overwhelming to people and that I have to cover it at a high level, but I'd like to take the different areas that you're working on, like the Healthy Corner Market, which is the first one that he covered, um, and to be able to drill down and tell people exactly what's going on and how they can get involved and be supportive um, if they'd like to. So we're lucky to have the folks at the Old Colony Memorial supportive of us and uh, willing to help get the word out. One more thing I guess I should say is that we, at that last summit that we had three weeks ago, we unveiled our new website, which is healthyplymouth.org. So I ask you to, when you have a moment, if you'd like to, go to www.healthyplymouth.org, and you will see um, different tabs for all of the um, uh, my community, my home, my work, my health, a lot of good information that we're going to keep fresh and alive. It's going to be refreshed on a monthly basis, so it'll be a nice resource and um, just a good picture of what we're doing. So. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the connection was with your local Chana? The local Chana has been um, very supportive. I actually sit on the steering committee of the local Chana, as does Deb. Um, and so we actually talked, it's interesting because that question came up earlier about the Chana, I was thinking about that. We talked about at the Chana, what should we be focusing on? What can be our areas of focus and how will we work with the Healthy Plymouth Initiative? And because Healthy Plymouth is focusing on um, uh, active living and healthy nutrition, the Chana decided after discussion that they would take a data-driven approach to what they wanted to focus on. So they actually went to the Boston Foundation's annual report where they do a report card on all the initiatives in the state, all the areas of the state, whether it's eating or living or uh, whatever category. And the Chana then said, okay, we know that Healthy Plymouth is focused on these initiatives. We're going to take on something that we think is equally as important and supportive of all of this. We're going to work on literacy, on health literacy, literacy based on the data that's available to them um, and working in collaboration with us. So, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Our, our next
speaker is Julie Kemble, who is co-leader of Helping Children Cope, of Friends of Hope at South Shore Hospital. Speakers. Thank you very much. It's fun for me to be back in a Chana group where the energy is as wonderful as it is because this was our birthplace. So there we are. Helping Children Cope is an all-volunteer program that got its start when the Cancer Center opened, the one affiliated with South Shore Hospital, the Dana-Farber Brigham and Women Cancer Center and clinical affiliation with South Shore Hospital. Put your child's head on as you go through this because I'm going to take you on a picture journey as well. So as I said, this is where we got our start. Wait, back one. The other way. Yep, no, one more. The other way. There we are. It was the opening of the Cancer Center and speaking to an unbelievable number of young women asking, what do we say to our children about my cancer? Do we say something? If we do, when? How? Should we even? And they, it, it just touched our hearts, those of us who were docents, to help walk people around the new building. And the picture of the little girl, 2.85 million children live in a house where there is an adult cancer. And this is not grandparents, this is not neighbors, teachers, or other loved ones. This is just adults. It's a staggering number. And while cancer is on the rise, so is survival. And we are affiliated with an, a primarily adult hospital. And yes, there's a pediatric unit, and yes, there's a pediatric emergency department. But a lot of what our hospital, and particularly the cancer center, who's the target population is the adults. And what we have come to realize in our program is that there is a tremendous amount of fallout of adult disease for very young children, who, the youngest of whom can't advocate for themselves. No, they can't wrap their minds about what is cancer, but they sure do know life isn't like it used to be. So we got our start literally, truly, with Chanab. We wanted to put a program together. We got word that there was going to be a grant opportunity that closed in two weeks. So five of us put our heads together. None of us had ever written a grant, ever in our lives. We put an idea together, we wrote up a grant, the hospital helped us, we submitted it one minute after the deadline, but they let it go through. And much to our amazement, we got it. Now what? <laughs> we have a grant and nothing else. We have $1,250 to work with. What are we going to do that will make an impact? We were granted for two years running, and this is what we did with it. We put a call out to the community for people who knew how to work with kids. Teachers, counselors, social workers, nurses. And we said, we're putting together a program for kids whose parents, grandparents, someone they love has cancer. And we were surprised how many people came forward. They had all been touched by cancer somehow, with a loved one or themselves. And they came with the skills already, so we didn't have to teach them about how to, how to work with kids. We had to teach them how to become a social hospital volunteer, however. So all of them trained and oriented and registered, and we had our first group. That on the on the left side of the screen is our first training group. On the right side of the screen was our last year's training group. That was year three. Now none of us, including myself, are paid. We are all volunteers. So it's, the power of volunteers is amazing. We also. Through serendipity is a wonderful thing. We got a puppy. What does that have to do with anything? Well, you take a puppy to a dog park. And in the dog park, you meet authors, artists, all kinds of people, social workers. And through a very close friend, <coughs> excuse me, I met a woman named Joan Brescher on the left. Some of you may know her work. She's been the artist in residence at Mass General Hospital, working at the bedside of kids with cancer for over 12 years now. She's a Lesley University graduate, a very accomplished artist, and her book, The Moon Balloon, this one, is worldwide, helping kids cope with things from of all kinds of disasters, illness, and whatever. I told her about the project, her eyes misted over, and Joan was in. So armed with her book and her wonderful approach to working with kids that opens their minds with imagination and inspires them, and together with um, 
the volunteers that we, we gathered, we had our first training session and our program was born. Next slide. Our program is meant to be easy to do for those who know how to work with kids. That's its whole beauty. It is a single session. Why not more? Well, because our goal is not to do therapy. It's to get the conversation started, give people book lists, community resource lists, get people tied in to people who are already there to work with kids. The hardest part is finding the kids. And give them a story and art experience that feels as normal and natural as a library story hour. That was our goal. And if we were really lucky, we could do it in a library. To be continued. We wanted also a companion pro program for the adults so that they would learn about ages and stages and why Susie has compassion and maybe Sammy doesn't. And it's not because Susie's a girl and Sammy's a boy necessarily. It's because compassion is not part of everybody's developmental makeup at every stage in life. And so helping parents understand some of the differences in their kids went a long way to helping them be less uptight about some of the behavior they saw. And we wanted it to be free. And if they couldn't come to groups, we would do it individually. Next slide. So why this age group? We started with 4 to 6 and branched from now to 4 to 10 because young children don't have the language around the, the words to talk about things. But they sure do have the ability to draw. And drawing crosses cultures, crosses ages, crosses genders, and it, uh, they feel more than they speak. And so in that sense, all children's drawings tell a story if you know how to read it. And we thought this might help parents have a way to start talking with these kids. Why art? One, it's natural. Kids gravitate to it. They do it easily. It's us that we have more trouble with art when we get start to get into our perfection mode. The kids, they don't go there. They, it's very easy. It's effective at all ages and stages of development. Kids can communicate around and through the symbols they use. It suits all temperaments. And, you know, at the very baseline, it's affordable. And with $1,250 to work with, we weren't going to get anything fancy. We were going to get affordable. And it's portable. It can be solitary or shared. And, and that is paying dividends back to us. Next slide. Why one session? As I said before, because we really want it. We're not therapy. We are inviting conversation to happen and letting it go from there. And so much of what goes on in the, in, the, in the services that we deliver is talking based. And it's adult based for kids. And our real belief is that if we got into the minds of the children, we would see the world in a very different way. We would look at health care in a very different way. We would look at meetings in a very different way. Um, next slide. And by the way, 75% of the people on our follow-up, we do follow-up at one month, say that they talk more, inspired by the children more than by themselves. And to tell you what it means, let me, I'm going to digress for just a moment. One of the children in our training program, who uh, we have kids for our trainings because we can demonstrate with them, her mom's favorite cat was, was dying in the vet's clinic. And it was right after the training, and the mom is falling apart. And little Cecilia walked herself over and got a piece of paper and a pencil and went to a corner and started drawing balloons. And the balloons, we'll need something in a minute. She was able to work out her feelings. Her mom sat down, she was curious about what she was doing. And Cecilia showed her, and pretty soon her mom was drawing balloons too. Her mom is a teacher and uh, called me to tell me how much better it made her feel. The eyes of a child. So what do we do in our sessions? We meet twice a month. These are our lost leaders, as I call them. We have the sessions, and uh, we don't get a lot of people. But we get a lot of awareness, and we get a lot of other things which you'll learn about. But we draw, as you see. We talk, and sometimes we sing. Uh, we have lots of community collaboration. You'll hear about it in a moment. The reason that I wanted to grab onto this book is the book is the thing that opens kids' minds to imagining in a good way. And these balloon symbols that the kids learn to draw with become the language in which they self-soothe, in the language in which they use their imaginations to take them to, to good things. What do you do when your cheer balloon is all full of water? 
And the kids talk about how you let the water up. You're in a stress balloon and it won't get up into the sky. How do you let go of it? Who's in that balloon with you? What would you take to feel good with? What would be your companion? Or who would be your companion? And the kids are off and running. In our, in our program, they see it. The parents are there. They watch what happens. And afterward, the parents have a session of their own and the kids continue to draw. So this is what we started with. And we, the first year, we served six whole families because we were so busy putting the program together, getting the materials and the resource list and all of those things. We didn't do anything about marketing. The hospital helped us, so we did have six families. So we realized if we were going to make an impact, we had to do something about marketing. And on the basis of that, we got another year's grant. And so we did brochures. We went on TV. We talked to people all over everywhere. We went to Children's East, East and Children's Museum, Weymouth Healthy Fairs. We went to the Hanover YMCA to teach their early learning centers in, in Hanover and Quincy about how kids can, how the teachers can work with kids to talk about feelings, not just about cancer, but about feelings. We walked for hospice and we met people there. We took ourselves everywhere we could go, the Pan Mass Kids Ride. And out of that, we built more collaborations, more connections, more families heard about us. Well, do we meet with kids individually, or now what we do is something very different? Um, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. We even did a community outreach program for grandparents and grandkids. And we had 95 people there who had a whale of a good time. We made a little money. I mean, we're not fundraisers. We're providers. So we live on a shoestring budget. We're pretty used to that. But on the other hand, we don't cost a lot because we're volunteers. And our, our materials don't cost a lot because it's paper and pens, books, and our training. Out of this, we built wonderful collaborations. Our major collaborations, besides the hospital, who is, is, is the safety net under our high wire act, as I like to say, um, the Moon Balloon Project, this is Jones. and. She's fully heart and soul into it with us. We have two libraries. The dream was realized. Hingham Public Library, Tufts Public Library, and coming on board is now Norwell Public Library. The libraries want to be involved. They want to be part of the community, and they see this as a way to do it. Old Ship Church. Ken Reed Brown, the picture you saw we sing, he wrote a melody, you'll hear it on the very last slide, um, to go with Joan's book. He took himself an hour out of town to a recording studio and recorded it so that we could have it, use it, and play it with the kids. It is, the, the melody will stay with you when you hear it. Youth Health Connection, a lot of you are familiar with the Youth Health Connection, and we do a lot of program and collaboration with them as well. The Friends of Mel, the Cancer Center, and much, much more. Next slide. This is Grassroots. So the, I mean, we really are knee deep in the grass. Um, training programs, we realize that we are stewards of what we know, not owners. And our purpose is to be able to take the tools. I mean, we have enough, enough of a track record to know that it works. It's simple to learn and quick to use. So we take this to the community. Every year we do a training. We open it to community professionals who are working with kids whether you're teachers, nurses, counselors, in whatever capacity, whether you're doing this in a church, a school, or in a daycare center. You can come for free, learn from Joan and from us how to use the book, how to use the method, how to talk about feelings with, with young kids when the topics are tough. And we're doing one on February 9th. There is a flyer. If you come to the house, South Shore Hospital table, you'll see the flyers for that. We're doing that in collaboration with the Friends of Mel, the Friends of Hope, and the Friends of Hope being also part of South Shore Hospital. And then we're doing a big conference, a big one. This one is a $20 fee, enough to cover everybody's professional, um, their, their, our, their continuing education credits. But that one is Cancer in the Family, Helping Schools Respond. This is a big one, and it's open, and we, we are part of many communities. In where we are located in, uh, in Weymouth. And so um, this is something that's never been offered on the South Shore. It's been offered in Boston, but never on the South Shore. So in collaboration with the Youth Health Connection, ourselves, and the Massachusetts, the Cancer, 
cancer support community of Massachusetts South Shore. I have to remember how these words come together. And other local groups to make this available to, for teachers and other school personnel to talk about how are we doing this in the school. Because where are the kids going? They're coming to the classroom. They're coming to the nurse's office. They're not necessarily coming to us, although they do, but that's not where the bulk of the kids are coming. And so the churches recognize this, the parochial schools recognize this, and the schools do as well, the public schools do as well. So um, the collaborations continue. People ask us, why are we focused on cancer? Well, cancer is one life-changing adult disease. We're now taking, taking on more. Disease is disease. The specifics of what one disease is over another to a young child matters not. We have kids who, who are helping parents get their own, or helping give parents insulin shots. And these kids are, are involved in their parents' illnesses. And we want to awaken the community to the fact that this is an underserved, under-recognized population source for us. Um, so we're now, pop there's the other aspect of that, though not everybody survives cancer. And so we're now partnering with Hospice of the South Shore to bring this program to them and us to their populations. And whether they do it in the homes of their patients or whether they, their patients come to us, where this happens and how it happens is sometimes a, a, a last minute thing. But when we're called, we go. And we've taken our program all over the place. And, and we're now beginning to branch out. Our volunteers are, are sturdy enough to take on new things. So, uh, but the one that I'm most excited about, I have a dream. You've heard that phrase before. I have a dream. And the dream is that there be an interactive arts, um, a, a multifaceted arts camp for kids to use it for arts and healthcare. This is what Leslie University is all about. And it's been a, a latent passion of mine to see such a camp come for kids who have lost someone. And that will be kicked off in 2014. The South Shore Conservatory is our willing partner in this. Hospice, Youth Health Connection, Leslie University, and we're building more. Truly, this is grassroots. I mean, would we be a bigger program if some of us were paid and we could do this full-time event? But we're doing it in our off hours. We're doing it on Saturdays. We're doing it if we, we meet at Panera in one location or another. We work out of our briefcases. We, we uh, do phone conferences in front of our computers. But this is the way things get done at a very grassroots level. I like to imagine that MAD got started this way too, but they got funding quicker than we do. And truthfully, if it wasn't for the Chana, we would not exist. It would have been a dream that didn't happen. So it is with eternal gratitude that I come back here, because you all believe enough in us to give us a chance, and gave us round two. We'll be back. I guarantee that. And this is about a program. This is not a big, wonderful community initiative like Plymouth. This is a little grassroots thing. But as President Obama learned in running his campaign, it is a lot of little grasses from lawn to lawn that make a movement. And um, this is what we're doing. So if you know people who would like to know more about the training, pick up a flyer. If you would like to know more about us, grab a brochure. We are, our website is available. I'll go to the, the very last slide. And there's Cam. The moon balloon is waiting to lift you up on a trip to your favorite place. So climb in the basket with a friend or a pet. Soon you'll be soaring in space. Moon balloon, moon balloon, a trip to your favorite place.
do have questions, I'm here. And we'll be when I, I move things around and I can stay for a little bit after this se section is over if you want to come <laughs> catch me. Otherwise, you can find me um, right there. And always from our website, you can find me and anybody in our program. Question? So have you thought about um, putting together some kind of booklet so that other communities can take this on as a project? Because it sounds like you guys have done such a great job of it. Um, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, set out some um, guidelines on how you got started, exactly the steps you took, that sort of thing would be really very helpful, I think, to look at that. This was our report. This was our year-end report to the Chinook. Every template, every thing we did is all in here. So can, we, can that so be made can, available? Our goal is to actually drill it down and make it something less, less, you know, sizable than this. Yes. I, it is one of those dreams of mine. I'm, I'm on the caboose trying to catch up with the engine of the train. But yes, it is. And um, hopefully we will have some volunteers come help us with that. But yes, we do want to do that. Our goal is that Helping Children Cope programs will be all over the place. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. The, Julie was funded by Chana 20, which is not one of the Southeast Chanas, but we have, we have some Chana 20 fans in the audience here because that's part of the Metro West region, which also has several high-performing Chanas doing great work and has a very strong and, and, and vital um, inter chana group led by the um, Metro West Regional Center for Healthy Communities, and Stephanie Nitka is here, and her, her colleagues that I, whose name I just lost. So, but in any case, uh, we're, we're pleased that folks are here from the Metro West region to, to share their stories and to, to network with us. So thank you very much, Julie. Okay, and I am the chair of Chinat 27. So I'm going to talk to you today about the Youth Suicide Project, which was, or is, a collaboration between Chinat 27 the Community Health Center of Cape Cod, and Cape Cod Healthcare. Um, in the fall of 2008, uh, Mass Department of Public Health gave eight Chennai's across the state the opportunity to apply for a grant to fund um, a youth suicide project. Um, and this was because, they were selected because um, <coughs> all of those represented areas um, had a higher than state and national um, average for youth suicide rates for non-fatal self-injury. Um, those uh, higher rates existed in those areas. Um, and so we, you can stay on that one for just a sec. So um, we were given this wonderful um, opportunity um, to be one of the areas that applied. Uh, the Chana Steering Committee um, got together and talked about, do we want to do this? This is uh, you know, a really big opportunity. Um, and we also, at that time, had a working group that was doing, looking at behavioral health um, initiatives. And so we asked them also to, to join us. And so we came to the conclusion that we really did need um, uh, to apply for this grant. Uh, the, um, we're very fortunate that although um, we're a very large area, uh, and with two islands, we have very good representation from, from both the islands. And at that time, Nantucket, um, already had a suicide prevention coalition, and they had someone um, that was hired through the Department of Mental Health to do uh, sort of community organizing around suicide prevention because they had had a significant number of youth suicides that happened all within a two-year period. And so, um, and they were sitting at our steering committee, still do. Um, so that was sort of, we decided this was something that we really did need to move forward with. So out of those eight Chinas, five applied, and three were awarded uh, the grant, and Chinas 27 was one of those. And we received $300,000 over a three-year period. The first year was a reduced year. Uh, I think it was nine months, we got 80000 And then the next two years, uh, we got 110000 each. Um, and this funding was made possible through a, a, a cooperative agreement between the Mass Department of Public Health and SAMHSA. Um, it was a Garrett Lee Smith Award um, that, the, that the state um, received. Um, again, 
we were just so um, thrilled. You know, when we wrote the grant, we uh, it, a lot of times the Cape and Islands, in particular, is looked at as an area where how could anything bad happen there? Look at the beautiful beaches. They're really a resort tourist area. I'm sure they don't have any problems down there on Cape Cod, and 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 so we recognized it's one of the things that we had spoken about numerous times at Archana around, you know, how do we market the Cape and Islands in a way that doesn't discourage people from coming here to vacation, but also makes people, particularly our legislators, see that we do have issues like the cities do, like this, you know, other towns and areas, uh, the, bit, the more rural areas off Cape. Um, go ahead to the next one. Um, and so, it, the Cape and Islands Youth Suicide Prevention Project was born. And um, one of the things that we needed to do, that we had to do when we wrote the grant, was to designate a lead agency. And so it was a natural fit to choose the Community Health Center of Cape Cod because at that time their director of behavioral health was a very, very active part of Chana and had been sort of um, overseeing the behavioral health working group at the Chennai level. Um, and he helped to write the grant. And so there was around five of us that, um, that actively uh, wrote the grant. We put it out to other members to sort of edit and tweak for us. And um, the department, uh, the Barnesville County Department of Human Services was a, a very integral part of putting that grant together, helping us do the data collection. Um, for years, we had done um, uh, data collection through the county um, uh, with, a, with a healthy condition, human condition surveys. And so we had all this data. Um, and so uh, we, they, had, they were really dedicated to the, to the cause. They had a good relationship with the other community health centers on the Cape. I think we have five um, on the Cape. And so um, it just made sense. At the same time, um, we had a parallel uh, process going on, and that was the creation of the Cape and Islands uh, Suicide Prevention Coalition, which is a across the lifespan coalition that was looking at suicide prevention. And it was part of the requirements of the grant that a coalition be formed, um, but we had already started that process before we even got the grant. So the two things happened sort of simultaneously, and they were connected, but they weren't the same thing. And, um, and the coalition uh, the uh, director of behavioral health at the community health center, which at that time was Tim Lineweaver, was also uh, to become one of the co-chairs and is still the co-chair of the Cape and Island Suicide Prevention Coalition, along with Beth Albert, who's the Department of Human Services Director at the county. And so we had these two parallel things going on, and the Chana again, was they were both born out of the Chana and particularly the behavioral health working group that we had um, going on there. Um, go to the next one. So we really did have a number of key organizations um, that agreed to be partners in this project. And I've listed just a few because it's impossible. In the grant, we had, I think it was a three page, three pages of, um, of partners that all agreed that suicide, and particularly youth suicide, was something that they knew that they needed to be a part of the focus. And so the Mass Department of um, Children and Families, um, the Mass Department of Mental Health, uh, the Cape and Islands Gay Straight Youth Alliance, uh, Barnesville County Department of Human Services, as I mentioned, Cape Cod Neighborhood Support Coalition, which is my organization, um, Nantucket Suicide Prevention Coalition, uh, the Wampanoag Tribe of Mashpee, very important that we had their buy-in, that, um, that we were incorporating some of the more underserved um, populations on the Cape and Islands. Massachusetts Maritime Academy, and all, a lot of the school regions. And I would say probably now we have probably all 15 school districts um, represented. NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, also became involved. Samaritans, um, Independence House, which is Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, A Safe Place on Nantucket, which does the same work, and Connect on Martha's Vineyard, they all became involved. Cape Cod Community College, um, we had a lot of faith-based um, uh, groups come forward. Um, Cape Cod Council of Churches um, showed some interest in, in receiving training. Um, we've trained people in the Mentor Network, MSPCC, Child and Family Services, South Bay Mental Health. It runs the gamut. We've had just a, an 
a wonderful, wonderful group of, of partners and supporters along the way. So um, in September uh, uh, of 2011, the grant funding ended. Um, and actually, that should say 2012. I was wrong. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, it was 2011. Um, but then the Mass Department of Public Health and the Community Health Center of Cape Cod saw this as such an important initiative and knew that three years was not enough to, to move this program forward that they decided to continue um, the program for another year. The, the state was in the process of writing to receive the Garrett Lee Smith Award again. And so um, also one of the three communities um, that was chosen, one of the three Chinook communities, could not fulfill all of their contract. So the other two of us were able to get some of that funding to continue. Um, we were also very fortunate in that, um, and I, I always tell her that she fell out of the airplane as she was flying back to the United States. Maura Weir, who is our project manager for the Youth Suicide Project, um, had been doing youth suicide work in Ireland. Um, she's a, she grew up in Dorchester. Um, she'd been doing this work in Ireland. She'd been going to college there, and then had moved to um, uh, Australia to do her master's in youth development and was coming back to the United States um, because she had some family issues that she needed to work on and she wasn't even around for two weeks when this job came up and so I tell her all the time she fell out of the airplane onto Cape Cod we hired her it's been just an, a, a tremendous relationship she's such an asset to us and we're so fortunate that even when we weren't sure if funding was going to be around, she stuck it out with us and is still the manager there. Um, so again, uh, in FY12, Cape Cod Healthcare came forward, um, and they gave the Youth Suicide Prevention Project $30,000 through the Community Benefits Grants. Um, and that was to support training and the development of educational materials. One of the things that we've done over the last four years, um, and was one of the goals of the project, was to increase awareness through education. And so a number of us got trained in different um, sort of disciplines around suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. And so we researched which uh, programs were evidence-based, which had good results. And so we went with, um, and the Department of Public Health did a, uh, helped us a lot with this work, QPR, which is Question, Persuade, Refer, which is sort of a little mini uh, training on how to recognize the signs, how to um, persuade someone to get help, how do you ask that question in the first place, are you thinking of suicide, and then how to refer them out. Uh, and then we, we wanted something a little bit with a little bit more meat to it, and so we, we got up um, together with um, NAMI New Hampshire, which, which created a program um, called Connect that uh, is also a youth suicide prevention, um, and it's discipline specific. And so a number of us were trained in the CONNECT model, uh, which is a half a day um, program. Um, and then we wanted to also make sure that we were touching all bases. And so three of us got trained uh, in what's called ASSIST, Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training, through Living Works, which is um, out of Canada. And, um, and we're now doing intervention trainings. Those are two days. We've so far trained, I think, um, about 35 people on the Cape. Um, in this intervention strategy. We also, Connect also has a postvention training, and a number of us took that so that we could work with communities in the event that a suicide did occur, we want to be able to come to that community, help them to look at what are some of the pieces, what are some of the things that we can do so that this doesn't happen again. How do we support that family, that community, who's been devastated by this loss, um, and yet let them grieve um, and give them the time to do that. So. Um, so we've been, that's been a huge part. So having the Cape Cod Healthcare and that community benefits money um, specifically targeted for the assist training um, has been just a, a real godsend. Um, and then this fall, we found out that, um, that we were to receive another three years of the grant. Um, and so um, the Youth Suicide Project um, continues to grow. Uh, we are almost in every school system. Um, we've done SOS, which is signs of suicide, um, in the schools. Um, as I said, Maura, um, this is her life passion, is to work in youth development, and in particular, um, to work uh, around the issues of youth suicide. And um, 
with the coalition, what we've been able to do, having recognized that working with youth suicide means that you have to work with the whole family. And so, um, how, you know, addressing the, the family members around this. Um, on the Cape and Islands, unfortunately, um, we have had a number of middle-aged men um, suicide. In the town of Falmouth last calendar year, we had 14 suicides. Um, uh, that was just in one town. And I believe nine of those were, uh, were, were uh, middle-aged men. Um, if you go to the next slide. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because that was one of our challenges. So one of the successes was that the Cape and Island Suicide Prevention Coalition was formed. It's strong. Um, it's working in collaboration with the Youth Suicide Project. Um, another success was our high engagement with schools. They are very much on board. They have sent people to get trained with us in QPR, in Connect, um, and so we're just really pleased to always have that connection with the school systems, not just the public schools, but also the private schools. We have a new um, Catholic school on the Cape. They've been very active. We have Sturgis Charter School, Falmouth Academy. They've all been very active in making sure that uh, their staff understand um, how to address the issues of suicide with the students, but also that the students know how to address it with their peers. Um, our challenges have been keeping that forward momentum despite the increased number of suicides um, on the Cape. And as I mentioned, um, middle-aged men, uh, it's, it's been really a tragedy. Those middle-aged men have children in their lives, and those children were affected by the suicide of that parent, that uncle, that family friend, that brother. Um, and so we recognize that, and we try to make sure that we are addressing even though it's a youth suicide project and our focus is on youth, we are addressing suicide across the lifespan. This new grant that we got is very specific, and I'm going to get, I'm not going to remember all of them because I didn't write it down, but there are, I think, four target areas. It is um, GLBT youth, gay, straight, bisexual, transgendered youth, um, uh, American Indian youth, so the Wampanoag tribe both on, Nant uh, on Martha's Vineyard, um, the gay head Aquina and the Mashpee Wampanoag. Um, it's also uh, youth in military families. Uh, we know that the military has a high rate of suicide. And I have to tell you that when I was trained in the, in the assist program, I went to North Carolina for a week um, around September, August or September of last year. And assist is a program that the United States um, uh, military uses. And there was 24 of us and only two of us were non-military. It was all military clergy, it was recruiters, they were all, the military has really taken this on strongly, um, Army, Navy, National Guard, Marines, and really looking at suicide. And so the grant is really specific to also working with those, um, with those families. And homeless youth. Um, we have an uptick in homeless youth on the Cape that are sort of couch surfing from family friend to family friend and sleeping at the campgrounds in the summertime, and so we wanted to make sure um, that we were able to address that. Particularly in the youth, it's like um, f 15 to 24 that, you know, late teen years and, and early adulthood years that um, we've been very, very concerned with. But, you know, again, you know, suicide uh, affects kids at all ages when you have uh, somebody in the family um, that has suicided. Um, so the next slide is just my um, information. Um, the Cape Cod Neighborhood Support Coalition, where I work, has been a very active partner, and I'm very grateful that, 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 um, that my funders let me do this. And in part because of my um, involvement with Chinat as the chair, over the last four years, I've kept a very close eye um, on, the, on the grant for the Chinat, um, but also because I thought it was important that we stay involved. Um, a, as a partner, and um, and and fortunately, um, Mora and the Cape Cod um, and the Cape the Community Health Center of Cape Cod agree that it's an important relationship, um, even though the grant has sort of moved out of the purview of Chana, that Chana stay involved, um, and that we have you know regular updates on, on what's going on, and um, and so that has uh, that has stayed um, current. Um, I didn't get a smiley face yet. <laughs> Which I'm surprised. Usually I talk way, way too much. Um, I can tell you some of the, um, I, you know, I didn't go into the specifics of what the, the um, grant itself 
what, what we did the first year was a lot around assessment and planning. And uh, we came up with five goals that uh, we wanted to make sure occurred. One was to promote awareness and improve accessibility to information about youth <coughs> suicide and youth suicide prevention and to increase the help seeking um, behaviors of youth. And that was really a key part. We wanted to improve the identification and referral of youth who could benefit from services. We wanted to promote protective factors and increase resiliency for at-risk youth. We wanted to enhance postvention and support services to those affected by suicide or suicide attempts. And we wanted to ensure sustainability of the Youth Suicide Prevention Project within the community after the life of the grant. Um, we've been able to accomplish a good part of all five of those goals. Um, but the work continues, and um, I'm really grateful uh, you know, to the Chana for my opportunity to be part of the Chana, and also to bring that forward um, at the inter Chana level also. So, thank you. Spot, but uh, you mentioned that you went down and trained in the military, and we read a lot about the problems the military having with suicides. Do you, in your opinion, see that that's maybe just indicative of the military, or maybe the community as a whole? Because the military is reflective of what communities are. Yeah, um, I think it's indicative of the community as a whole. I think there are specific challenges around um, military service, um, particularly during a time of war, and. You know, we know that um, uh, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress play a huge role in that. I'm not a military um, expert, uh, but I think that, you know, so many of our military, particularly on the Cape, are embedded in communities. They don't live on base. Some of them do, but most of them are embedded into our communities. So I think for us on the Cape and Islands, it's really more of a, a you know, it's, it's a community problem. And we're very fortunate that we have um, a very active, um, it's called um, Operation Military Kids, which which works um, uh, out of the um, Boys and Girls Club in Mashpee and also through the 4-H uh, Youth Development um, at the count, at Barnstable County. And so we have that connection, we have that military connection also. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody? And so to make sure that when we were giving out resources, we were giving them resources that were, you know, everywhere so that they could go outside of their own town. And on the Cape, for instance, I live in Falmouth, but I work in Hyannis. So, you know, maybe I want to stop somewhere, you know, in between. Um, and so we made sure that all of the services were embedded within the community. We tried really hard. We're not 100% successful with that. But that also, that, that the whole idea of suicide prevention really is... Um, it's a community issue and it's a community problem and the solution has to be community based. So I did get my smiley face. <laughs> so thank you very much. You guys have been great. And I didn't hear any stomach stuff. afternoon with a uh, presentation by Marty Ribble, who's the Director of Policy and Communications at the Massachusetts Public Health Association. I note that there's literature and information out on the, what was the registration table this morning about MPHA for those who are interested in learning more about them. Hello, good afternoon everybody. Uh, as Ron said, my name is Maddie Ribble uh, with the Massachusetts Public Health Association. Um, very, very happy to be here today with all of you. There's a number of you that I know pretty well and have worked with closely, but a lot of people I don't know, which is always more exciting to be in a room with people I don't know. And, and, uh, so I hope we'll have the opportunity to work together over the years ahead. Um, but we've had a, a, you know, a lot of really interesting speakers and uh, folks who haven't been speaking have been sitting um, very politely in your chair. So I'm going to ask people in the first part to sort of move around and stand up a little bit just to get people awake after lunch so I don't want to see too many people <laughs> nodding off to sleep uh, for, the, for my speakers who come next. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a couple of statements and um, if these are true for you I just want to ask you to stand up. Um, 
stand up if you have ever gotten in touch with um, a local official, a city councilor, a, board, a person on your board of selectmen, a mayor, um, emailed, called them, got in touch with them about an issue you cared about. Wow. <laughs> wow, this is, this is a pretty cool group. I'm very impressed. <laughs> right, okay, you can sit down. <laughs> How many of you have attended um, a, 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 either a select board meeting locally, a zoning board meeting, um, a ag board meeting in your local community? Stand up. Holy cow. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> How many of you have... Um, submitted a letter to the editor to your local paper or an opinion piece to your local paper? I have never seen a group like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that, especially for this question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have uh, been to the State House to visit your elected officials? All right, have a seat, please. How many of you have given a formal testimony um, at a hearing at the State House. Very nice. And uh, lastly, how many of you have uh, been in touch with your federal elected officials uh, about an issue you care about? Great. And, and uh, of, of those that stood on this last question, how many of you have been to DC to visit your federal elected officials in person? It's just, I've never had this many people stand up. Yeah. <laughs> so, congratulations. Um, and I may just sort of skip the rest of my presentation. <laughs> you, you all uh, probably know everything I'm going to say. You, uh, I'm sure, know how much uh, power you can have that way. I want to maybe just ask a couple people, um, what was, uh, what was something that you accomplished with any of the work that you stood up for? Something that you saw concrete that you achieved that you're proud of? Anybody, raise your hand. Yeah. Tobacco policy. What specifically? Um, mm -hmm. Youth access, reg, smoke free restaurants, um, ban of the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. Great, so a lot of issues on tobacco that we've achieved uh, success in through policy. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, getting a Walmart. Sidewalk in Wareham, where they're constructing. Mm, I don't know if, if everyone Nancy can hear. Really was the can everyone here in the back talk about getting um, a local Walmart that was coming in to put in a sidewalk in front of their store? Um, and it's a great example of some of what Leah Susan was talking about this morning, thinking about a broader environment. This work can clearly also be challenging and frustrating and take a while and feel like we're not getting anywhere, we're pounding our heads against a wall. So has anyone had one of those challenging experiences like that that you would want to share? Anyone who had a time where they, you know, you, you, you got active but you felt like your voice wasn't, uh, wasn't really being heard or you weren't really getting anywhere? Um, on the equal, on the paper. Equal, the equal pay for women. Um, I challenged Scott Brown on it, and he didn't tell the truth on it, and he voted against it. You're challenging uh, Scott Brown or any other elected official. Equal <laughs> 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 pay for women who um, you know, didn't happen as you wanted. Yeah. Well, he voted against, but he got my email and called me back. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that's good. Responsiveness is good. Uh, um, all right, so, uh, you know, like I said, this is a very active group, so I'm going to, you know, not even say some of my points, but uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, us at the Massachusetts Public Health Association, we're a statewide membership organization made up of organizations and individuals working together to change state policy to promote public health. Um, we do this through a combination of uh, working to be a very uh, effective inside player at the state house and with state agencies, while also building uh, really strong and robust partnerships at the local and regional level um, to work to a understand what the issues are on the ground. Because um, we're a small staff based in Boston, um, so we might be very smart or we might read all the reports, but we don't know the issues going on um, in all the communities in the southeast. So uh, those partnerships really help us understand what's going on. 
Um, and those partnerships are also essential because you all and the people like you and all the regions of the state are the folks that roll up your sleeves and do all the things you just stood up for um, that get things done. Any success we've had as an organization is because um, all of our partners like you have rolled up your sleeves to get things done. Um, and we have been very proud to work with a lot of partners on the South Coast um, and in the whole Southeast region, um, including Voices for a Healthy South Coast, Healthy City Fall River, um, YMCA South Coast and uh, the Center for Southeast Center for Healthy Communities prior to that system uh, going through a transition. And I did want to just introduce um, some of my colleagues who are here who you may know. Um, our, our new executive director, Toby Fisher, who's here, who's a longtime um, advocate and coalition builder, previously with the National Alliance for Mental Illness, which was talked about in uh, one of the last presentations, as well as Andrea Freeman, who's our deputy field director. Uh, who I know uh, worked uh, closely with many of you on the planning committee to get this event uh, planned for today. These are just a few of the issues and victories that MCHA has worked on over the last number of years. We worked for many years to pass school nutrition legislation to impact what kids are eating in our public schools. Uh, you would think that wouldn't be that controversial, but we fought as an organization for years and years with the soda industry who wanted to make sure their products were, were in public schools and especially in high schools. Um, and we know that's bad public health policy, and we want eventually, as we usually do, even if it takes a while. Um, and those regulations that went into effect this August impact one million public school kids in Massachusetts. We've, we've worked uh, on funding for the State Department of Public Health and either expanded or protected tens of millions of dollars in funding for DPH over the last five and, five and ten years. Uh, we helped to create the State Food Policy Council through legislation. Leah Susan this morning mentioned the Healthy Transportation Compact, the first in the nation bringing our state agencies on health and transportation to work together. Um, and of course, we have, uh, we led the effort to pass the Prevention and Wellness Trust Fund over the last two years, uh, working with many of you here in this room. Uh, this is, um, the, this picture at the top is one of the press conferences we did at the end of the campaign here, that's Senator Harry Chandler of Worcester speaking at this event. Um, and the thing I want you to know about the Prevention and Public Health Trust is this is really one of the most historic achievements in public health policy that we have accomplished together in many, many years. Um, we, we scrape and fight and beg and plead for you know, every $100,000 in public health prevention funding in the state budget year after year after year. This year the legislature put up $60 million for prevention um, and that's really an unprecedented investment. And it, it's a testament to the understanding that our policymakers um, have grown into over the years to understand the role of prevention. Um, and they've understood that partially because we've been up there and banged down their doors and uh, told them about it over and over. But a lot of it is because they've seen prevention working in their communities. They've, seen, they've been out to visit your programs and seen what you're doing on the ground through the Chinas or through Mass in Motion. And they, they got it because they saw those people and those stories, and they knew that money would matter. Um, so uh, the, the trust is dedicating $60 million over four years. Three quarters of uh, those dollars have to go out uh, to the community level in competitive grants. And those competitive grants uh, need to be used to combat uh, the most costly health conditions our state is facing. Uh, with evidence-based programs. So we set this up not to say we want to address X, Y, or Z health issue or focus on X, Y, or Z community, but to say dollars need to follow the data. So we need to know what are the health conditions that are costing us the most, that are amenable to prevention at the community level. And let's take those community strategies that we know work, because we funded pilots and demonstration programs for years, um, but they're usually very small and they have a small impact. Let's take those strategies, ramp them up, um, with more funding and over a longer period of time so we can get a bigger impact. Um, but it's important to remember, this was included in a cost containment bill. And the goal of it is to reduce health care costs. And this really is an experiment. Uh, they put up this money for four years, and then the program needs to be evaluated. If we can show after four years that we've been wildly successful, it's not going to be a problem at all to double that amount for the next <coughs> four years because they're going to see it's getting impact on the ground and it's saving money. But if we don't have much to show after four years, um, 
we're not going to get very far in the four years afterwards. Um, so we really need to make sure the programs that are funded get those results and health outcomes and can lead to uh, health care cost savings over the years ahead. Um, this was really, I mean, we know that there's more and more data about health care cost savings related to prevention. I think all of you know that, so I'm going to put a skip over that. But I do want to say that this effort um, was a gigantic one of many, many partners participating uh, in this. Nearly 100 legislators from across the state were active. And again, that's not because we called them up. That's because their constituents called them up and told them how important this was. Um, and, I, and I do have to give a shout out to my colleagues in Fall River and a challenge to everybody else in all the 350 other communities in the state. Every time we've done anything where we've put a call out to get legislative support, we always have 100% of the Fall River delegation uh, because of the folks here. And we want to challenge everyone else. For a Every other thing that we're working on collectively where we need legislator support, we want to see people be just like Fall River and get 100% of their delegations on board and think what we could do if we could, if we could do that in this region and all the other regions of the state. But this involved mayors and involved town managers and involved business and involved philanthropy. I'm going to talk in a, at the very end here about uh, our Act Fresh campaign and the folks here that are involved in that were very active. Um, and I can't say enough, especially being here in Plymouth, about the role of our Senate President, Terry Murray, who of course is from uh, right here in Plymouth. She was one of the uh, most important reasons that we got leverage on this issue. She was committed right from the beginning to making prevention a core piece of this. Even though it wasn't in the paper every day, it wasn't um, what she was getting visits on from the, the big, uh, the folks who have a lot of money, it was sort of a side issue, but she knew it was important. And she said, I'm going to put it right at the center. And the bill that came out in the Senate made a very, very significant investment in prevention. So folks who live here in Plymouth or in her district, if you haven't already, please make sure to thank her. Uh, we always uh, ask our legislators to do things, or we complain when they don't do things. But we often forget to thank them when they do stand up for what's right. So please make sure to thank her. Um, we had really active support from this region of the state. These are two op-eds that ran um, in local papers here, one from Mayor Flanagan, again in Fall River, and then um, from her very own Nancy Bunnell um, at the uh, New Bedford paper with Karen Van Noonan, who is our uh, former board president. Uh, we have created this fact sheet, which I believe is in everyone's folder, so hopefully you've received this, because people ask us a lot of questions um, about exactly what it is and how it works. This fact sheet really sums up pretty much everything we know right now about what's in the legislation and what the time frame is for this. Um, one piece I didn't say that I should fill in is, is the entities who are eligible to apply, because that's an important question people want to know. Um, we wanted to build on the success of Mass in Motion, which is very successful because there's buy-in from local uh, leadership, uh, mayors, town managers, um, and other local officials. So the eligible entities are municipalities, municipalities who work together regionally, which we hope there'll be applications of regional collaborations, like here. Also, in that vein, regional planning agencies, um, as well as other community organizations, health plans, health providers, who are partnering with a municipality or a regional planning agency are also eligible to apply for that 75% of the funding. We expect that there'll be an RFP available hopefully in the spring. Um, so we have a little bit of time. The funds won't actually be available till next summer. Um, so uh, it's sort of too bad we have to wait till next summer. But on the other hand, we have the time to really plan and do it right and make sure the RFP is right so we're going to have success. Um, this fact sheet is on our website, which is on my last slide. Uh, we're going to be updating it as the timeline uh, is updated and as there's other opportunities for public input. Um, so you can check back on our website or get on our email list to learn uh, what the new details are about this. So, uh, so what's next coming up? What's the environment um, in 2013 and going forward for us? Um, it, it, the, the focus really now is going to be on the implementation of this cost containment bill known as Chapter 224. The effort is moving away from the legislature um, into implementation. Um, if you look at this bill, the word may, M-A-Y, shows up in the bill almost 400 times. 
So there's a lot of work still to be done. We have a piece of paper on the shelf right now. We need to make that real on the ground. There's a lot of work to be done in state agencies and with local partners. Um, so again, if you want to stay involved in how that's getting implemented, get onto our email list and we'll keep you updated. There is really a new frontier, um, as you all, I think, are on the front lines of, of the integration of clinical care and population health. Um, this is not a new area. People have been working on this for many years. Many of you have been working on this. But it's really being taken to the next level with the uh, new financial arrangements under the Affordable Care Act and under this payment reform bill. And I think there's no one who yet has it quite figured out how it's going to work. Um, and that's not going to be decided at the State House. That's going to be decided <coughs> through collaborations like this. Um, so we're going to be looking to you all to figure out how this works and to how to replicate it. And as I said, the Prevention Trust is an experiment. If we don't get this right in the next four years, our job going forward is going to be very, very challenging. Um, so we, we really have to get it right. Because of all this work, there's a little fatigue in the legislature with health and health care. They've been, had this banged over their heads day after day for three years. You're not going to see a lot in the legislature on health care. Um, but it creates some other opportunities. Um, we have, we have major state uh, budget challenges. We're, we're $100 million short of our benchmarks for this state fiscal year. And there's this minor thing called the fiscal cliff you may have heard about, which we don't know how it's going to impact us. Um, but we have, um, we have some new opportunities. I'm going to sort of skip ahead in the interest of time. Uh, these are four opportunities we have in the next year. I already talked about <coughs> implementation of the uh, Prevention Trust. Um, Transportation is going to be a big policy issue in the legislature this year. Uh, new revenue to shore up both our roads and bridges and our public transportation system um, are going to be under discussion. Um, there's been a lot of talk in previous speakers about walking and biking infrastructure. We need to make sure any transportation policy fully incorporates walking and biking infrastructure um, on both operating and capital expenses. Um, but also, don't forget that public transit is almost always the middle leg of a walking trip. People walk to, to, whether it's a train, whether it's a bus, they walk to transit and they walk on the other end. People who commute by transit uh, to work can get their full, uh, all of their recommended physical activity just walking to a train or walking to a bus um, without ever thinking about exercise. So public transit is a really important public health um, opportunity and in every region of the state, not just in the MBTA service area, but every region of the state has a regional transit authority, which are dramatically underfunded, and we need to make sure if we're talking about transportation revenue, our regional transit authorities uh, are funded adequately. Okay. All right, so here's four more, because four isn't enough. And I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna just mention these briefly. People have mentioned we're still uh, implementing our school nutrition standards, uh, and we need to protect those uh, from any rollback. We have access to expand uh, uh, access to grocery stores and healthy food and corner stores uh, in the legislature this year. We always need to be uh, paying attention to protecting DPH funding, um, and we need to get more fiscal activity in schools. These are all things that are going to be before the legislature that there'll be opportunities for this year. Um, Andrew, can you go back to that fresh slide? I'm going to say just 30 seconds about this. Um, a couple years ago, um, in an effort to expand our partnerships all around the state, uh, we launched something called the Act Fresh campaign. And we brought together a leadership team representing uh, five regions of the state to identify, as I said before, what are the most important issues on the ground? What are the issues that people in your region are ready to roll up their sleeves and get to work on? We didn't want people to come advise us. We wanted to people come to us to talk about the issues and to say, I and the people uh, I work with are ready to get to work. We've had incredible success in this effort. Um, we're moving forward into the, into the next two years. We hope you'll be involved in it. I know we're short on time, so we'll, you know, we'll be we'll real, real really brief about it. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, when, and, and, and I know we're preaching to the choir here because you guys all stood up. But until three years ago, I had never done any of this. And so um, when I first met Maddie a couple of years ago at our summit that we had, uh, Voices for a Healthy South Coast, he called me up and he said, so Nancy, <laughs> I need someone to talk about physical education at the State House um, for this hearing. And I said, Maddie, why me? 
And I, I think it's because I know each and every one of you are so passionate about what you do. So I started as uh, I went to school for physical education and I wound up at the YMCA um, for 30 plus years. But he asked me to come up and speak. Um, I was scared to death, but my team came with me, a lot of them are right here, and they said, Nancy, you can do this, but it was just, it was a phenomenal experience, and so I just encourage you, when someone does ask you to do something like this, be brave, you can do it, and, and it, it was just a great feeling to know that um, you could bring a personal experience to the State House, and people are there to listen, and the room was packed. We had like overflow into the hallway, so it was just a, it was, it was a really um, wonderful experience for me. That's what I have to say. There you go. I, I would just amplify what uh, Nancy's saying. Um, Val Bassett, are you here? She's back there. There you are. Under Val's leadership uh, a few years ago, uh, the MPHA, which quite honestly, if you asked me six or seven years ago, uh, I would say, oh, MPHA, that's all those people up in Boston. They have nothing right. to do with us, and they're not going to help us, so, you know, why do I need to be involved? But uh, you made a deliberate effort to, to reach out to people all over the state, not just in Southeast. But uh, uh, Nancy and I were able to respond and uh, started working with folks on the Act Fresh campaign. It's tough down here because in a lot of ways, we don't know all the ins and outs, and you get into a room full of people from Boston, and it's like, who are these folks, and what do they know, and you know, what do I know, and all that. But it takes a little while, but once you get going, then you begin to see how we have an impact down here. I'm getting the high sign down there. <laughs> but don't be afraid now, under Toby's leadership, uh, it, that's going to continue, and we can all get involved. and. We, I think we're on a roll here in Southeast, and I think people in this state know we're here. Great, okay, thanks so much, everybody. I'm just going to put up a slide with a contact information here as we transition. Um, I really appreciate your time, and I really appreciate all that you've already done. I really hope we'll have the opportunity to work together more um, in the years ahead. Thanks so much. Thank you. And if I think we just talked about Let's get together and talk about collaboration. We did so in the context of a changing environment where, where prevention is now real to the policymakers and to the legislators that hasn't been as much the case in the past. So thank you to MPHA for all your efforts to, to, to bring this about. Although we're talking about this great prevention work that we do in the community, I think we need to remind ourselves that we have to take care of ourselves. A level of self-care needs to be done. So we're going to do a nice... Um, stretch break. Oh, I'm Angela Braz. This is uh, Brittany Bertone and Amory Sharkey. And if you could please stand. <laughs> and straight up. And down. Up. successful, uh, creative, innovative uh, community strategies. We have Carrie Mello, uh, Community Benefits Manager at South Coast Hospitals Group, and Marta Gonzalez, who's the Program Manager at the Wellness Connection at the Greater New Bedford Community Health Center. And they're going to talk about a wonderful program uh, with Greater New Bedford Allies for Health and Wellness. Carrie and Mara are both members of that steering committee. Thank you very much, Ron. And everybody's wide awake now, so so this is great. I had I had my fears that speaking after lunch would not be a good thing, but that will strike while the iron's hot. So today, Martha and I are going to talk about a project that South Coast is involved in with Greater New Bedford Allies to build a community, really, of community health workers. Um, our missions, our mission at South Coast and the mission of the Community Health Center really converge in a lot of ways. Um, in our mission, it's not just caring for the health of our community, it's also improving the health of our community, and that's an important thing. And the mission of GND Allies channel the communities of, of Greater New Bedford into action 
so that they can achieve better quality of life for everyone. So we're, there's a lot of convergence there, not just Greater Bedford Allies, but also our other Chana <coughs> partners for a healthier community. So we've heard a lot about population health today, um, caring for the health of the population and keeping them out of the hospital rather than simply treating people when they come into the hospital. So this is something that we've been doing for a number of years, trying to keep people healthy, and that we'll be doing, as Maddie mentioned, it's, it'll be more imperative um, to do it in the future. You hear buzzwords like population health, ACOs, capitation. Those are all things we're looking at in new ways and looking for new ways to collaborate with our communities because we can't keep people healthy by ourselves. Um, where people live, where they go to school, where they play, all affect their health as well as when they're treated in the hospital. So an important question in this is who, who is our population? And we know on the South Coast our population is culturally diverse. They have many, many health risk factors and they also face <laughs> significant barriers and disparities in their efforts to lead healthy lives. So again, place matters. That's kind of a very important message that we've tried to convey. And Martha. <laughs> so some facts about who our population is on the South Coast. These, um, I got these statistics from Mass Chip, and this is taking a look at what the Department of Public Health considers to be discharges for primary care manageable conditions. So these are conditions really if they're well managed, People should not be admitted to the hospital. You'll see that on the South Coast, especially in our three main communities, we're much, much higher <laughs> than the state average. Um, and, and you know, this isn't a good thing, and it just doesn't apply to um, getting treated at the hospital or, or going to see a primary care doctor or getting a test. It has to do with, again, where people live, do they have access to healthy uh, fruits and vegetables, can they exercise, do they face violence in their neighborhoods. So those are all things that we need to take a look at and we need to work with the community to, to try to have an impact on. When you look at subpopulations within our overall population, you see that the statistics get even more alarming. When we look at the South Coast, uh, the Greater New Bedford Chana as a whole, Diabetes hospitalizations, which again are a chronic uh, disease management kind of condition, it's 11% higher, which is significant, but not as significant as when you look at the city of New Bedford, where diabetes hospitalizations are 56% higher. And then within New Bedford, when you look at the Hispanic population versus the, the rest of the community, they're much, much higher. So, these kinds of statistics are make it obvious to us that we need to be reaching out into these communities if we really are going to have an impact on population health. Um, one other little fact, and this, this arose this year from some work that we're doing in, in Wareham, where there's a very large homeless population. People wouldn't think, um, you know, as Bev said, of the Cape and Wareham as being a place yeah that has a lot of health issues, but there's a significant number of homeless there. We've been uh, in a leadership role with a coalition there, and, and we were, as a coalition, trying to look at what is the cost of homelessness. And we discovered that a very small group of chronically homeless residents um, in just one year had over $400,000 worth of charges in our emergency department. We you know, want to take care of these people because we are kind of the last resort, but is this really the best use of the resources of the entire system, not just the hospital, but the entire community system? And, and most importantly, does it best serve the health of this population? And I think you know, as, as part of our coalition, we all would answer, no, we need to kind of do a better job collaborating, looking at things like housing, versus, not versus, but in addition to access to primary care and those kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, issues. So this is where I kind of get into our CHW program. It's funded through DON linkage funds from South Coast. Right now we've committed a total of $415,000 over five years and you know perhaps more funding uh, than that will be coming. 
We developed the program in collaboration with Greater New Bedford <clears throat> allies because we thought the need in Greater New Bedford was very strong. And we wanted, I mean, 415000 sounds like a lot of money, but we wanted to create a program that was going to have an impact. So that's why we were focusing on New Bedford. And it's been a true collaboration with input from lots of community groups in designing exactly what this is going to look like. So some of my fellow outreach people are here today, and they're probably going to be upset that I've got their pictures up here. <laughs> we, we do. You might look around and see some of them. We do a lot of outreach. We have a great cardiac prevention program, a mobile health van, our RAP program, which serves local youth. So we're out there doing outreach, but it's obvious to us that we really need to reach into the community through relationships of trust and understanding rather than just the hospital sort of going out into the community yeah. with our health van. And we try to do that, but we think that the community health outreach worker model will help us to do that in new ways. And I'm now going to introduce Martha, who <laughs> is the wellness um, coordinator of the Greater Bedford Community Health Center, and she has been a community health outreach worker for many, many years. So she can speak to the role of the CHW, I think, really well, and I will go. <laughs> my glasses on. Thank you. Um, before I can speak, I can uh, let you know I've been a community health worker for about 30 years already, so I feel very tired already. <laughs> 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 but really, I, I have to say that I really love the work that I've been doing all these years, and um, I think this is a true connection to my heart. And every, every time I see all of you guys are community health workers to me, because all of you guys are getting some ideas that you're going to go back to your community and share it with somebody. And that makes a big, uh, a big uh, commitment to the community. Um, the, our connect, the community health workers have trusted links between traditional health care system and the community. Uh, important resources for education and advocacy. I've worked in the health center and I know they come in there and they, they wind up seeing doctors and nurses and everything, but you know what? If the patient is not having a linkage with somebody in there, the care is not going to carry out completely. Um, more or less, this is the connection I'm, try, I'm trying to uh, talk about. We are, as a community health worker, at the front line of the whole uh, community. Linkage between uh, good health care and the doctor and the nurse. If you don't have that linkage, uh, no matter how many times you go to an appointment, no matter how many times you prescribe, you give a prescription or anything, it's not gonna uh, it's not gonna make a difference on the patient if the linkage is not there. Community health workers um, are responsibilities. In 30 years, I have had to even now sell myself as a community health worker and be respected as a community health worker. Uh, doctor, everybody that has a title and everything because the community health worker did not get a title and a master's or a BA or something like that. I, um, I, they tend to feel that it's not a respected, not respected, but they're afraid of letting the patient link with that person. Uh, one perfect example is if you have, if a doctor sees a uh, Spanish-speaking patient. No matter how good the doctor is, no matter how many masters the doctor has, if they don't have somebody translating, it's not going to make an impact on that patient. Um, so we have to understand any community health worker um, will perform their duties with honesty. They do have confidentiality, and they keep their patients uh, whatever they say in confidentiality. Um, they do need training in whatever they are going to be involved in. 
I've been, uh, I first started as a maternal child health worker. So what happened is I went to training to, the, uh, to learn everything about pregnancy, what to do with patients and everything. You just can't throw a community health worker into a sector without giving them the training that it's needed. Um, quality of care and the referral to appropriate services and legal obligations are also there. Uh, re I, as a community health worker, would turn and say, well, this patient needs a referral to so-and-so. I can tell you that I would never refer anybody unless I know where they were going. Because if I didn't know where they were going, that patient was not going to hear me the next time I spoke with them. And I've had doctors that I had to call, and because they were new in the hospital or they were new at the office, I would make an appointment with them and go and talk to them and find out what kind of care they were going to give my patient. So it, that is really important. In uh, 70 years I've worked in the health center, I, I still have patients that I met the first year I started there coming in looking for me. And that's because the linkage was there and they trusted me so much. And the only way you can the only way you can build it is that way. Um, the GMB allies cancer disparities. Um, uh, Carrie talked about the RFP that we put out uh, for agencies to be able to apply for it. Uh, we actually uh, have on December 15th, there's the 45-hour training that was designed for certification standards for community health workers, and it's being uh, completed 45 hours in December for, go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, um, three grants were awarded through this RFP. Uh, uh, one went to the YWCA of Southeastern Massachusetts, the other one went to Coastline Elderly Services with the Greater Universal Community Health Center, and the other one to Immigrants Assistance Center. And um, the training had trained um, by December 15, 20 community health workers, which means the community health workers that were hired through those RFPs Plus, we were able to open it up to the other communities, the uh, people that were involved in GMB allies to send their own community health workers to get trained. Uh, the wider impact of the community health worker, I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, actually, the whole circle will tell you that everything is all connected to each other. I mean, if you have one, um, the GMB allies and community, the project, and then we're also connected with the Fission Partnership of United um, Interfaith Action, uh, uh, Voices, uh, the CPG grant, uh, when we, um, when Nancy winded up writing the thing, we were all involved in it, and they're also hiring uh, uh, community health workers and the United Interfaith Action was also involved too. Uh, the Community Health Worker Vision, um, there's eight of them in there. <laughs> and with, it, it shows that in order to be a piece of the pie, you have to have every, every section in there. What we found is we have our project, and as, as we began to reach out to other people in the community about CHWs, we, we discovered that the fishing partnership, and I apologize for the, the typo there, they weren't connected with United Interfaith Action, but the fishing partnership <laughs> had trained fishermen's wives um, to be community health outreach workers, and so we've been able to actually already connect through Deb. Deb Machi is, is here, still here today. I think she is one of their first community health outreach workers. Um, and then Voices for a Healthy South Coast, which is a co coalition that we're all part of, was able to get a million dollar um, CTG grant to bring into the community to further create more uh, 
community health outreach workers that will be devoted to the local housing projects, public housing. So already the, the program has kind of mushroomed a bit. Um, one of our goals for this year is to create a formalized network of community health outreach workers here on the South Coast. There's one statewide called Machua. And so we're hoping to, um, you know, to, to kind of leverage what we've done and, and have that here on the South Coast as well. So, and, and we're excited to be able to make this connection and then hopefully have it evolve into a real clinical kind of connection with CHWs. Yes, I think we're done. We're getting the, the smiley faces gone. Now we're getting the numbers. Any questions? So, uh, I, I knew, because I've had a little bit of experience with Matchwa in the, in the past, um, and I knew that there was, that the state was working on a certification. Right. Has that been completed? No, are, are those regulations up yet? They've just begun meeting on a monthly basis, and actually some people from the South Coast have gone up to a couple of those meetings. Well, we tried to do in our 45-hour training, working, you know, Ron's been a huge um, assistance to us with this, is use what now are considered to be kind of best practice training guidelines, which we hope <coughs> and expect may be the basis for certification. We're not sure of that because it hasn't happened, but we're trying to get that high level of training for CHWs right from the start. So training was a big piece of the, the grant and, and the RFP. I know we have a, um, a physician uh, group on the Cape, uh, Emerald Physicians, that has mm -hmm. patient advocates which have play the same role. And um, I can't tell you how many times I hear across the Cape, you know, people can't wait to get into that physician's office because mm -hmm. of the follow through that the community health workers, that the, that the patient advocates are able to do. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just about their physical health. It's mm -hmm. okay, so we got you to that doctor. now. You know, I heard you say something about, you know, you haven't really had any access to, you know, really good foods. You know, can I get you a voucher to the food pantry? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they fit so well in so many different ways. And yes. so I applaud you guys for doing that. And we're, we're really excited about the project and all the collaborations that have, have resulted from it. How much, the, for the community health workers, like how much of it is it that can be trained versus what is, you know, talent and a, a natural... Skills. You know, I, I think the people who we've only been involved in this in this one initial training, but I think um, I don't know if Deb is still here from the fishing partnership, but I think the fishing partnership decided to train fishermen's wives, which I think you know is a brilliant idea because they're very plugged into the community. The the people that we've trained, some are existing CHWs who are involved with some of these agencies. Others, you know, sort of function as, as CHW. As a community health worker, I don't believe that you you opt to be trained in other different areas, but you can't expect a community health worker to enter an agency and be completely trained to do what they you want her to do. I, I guess just what I wanted to, that I dawned on me is that there's so much, there's an inherent talent, you know, a knack for being able to do that work. In, in, you know that you need in addition to whatever formal training. I, I think what helps is, is that they're they're already embedded into the communities that yes. they're working in, and yes. so that you're gleaning these community health workers right. out of mm -hmm. where places they're where they're already living and with this population, yeah. mm -hmm. so that there is that trust and mm -hmm. understanding right. is already developed before they right. even go in. Right, and and you're and we're providing kind of formalized training that hopefully will lead to certification. Yeah. And better pay, because you guys are not paid enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yes, I would agree that there are certain innate abilities, and some some is drawn out of experience. I know community health workers who are community health workers because at some point in my life they had an experience where either they benefited from from the assistance of a community health worker or someone similar and said, that's what I want to do. There, there are people in this room today who are being trained in this community health worker training who I know have the passion and the heart to do this, that kind of work. And that's first and foremost what it takes. If people have their hearts in the right place. And with Stuart Healthcare and our presenters are Monique Alleman, who is the Vice President for Mission Community Health and Partnerships at Good Samaritan Medical Center. Deb Rogers is Director of Care Management at uh, Wharton Hospital, and Brittany Lynch, 
in social services at St. Anne's Hospital. So I but it is my pleasure. Oh, I would be remiss after that wonderful presentation on community health workers if I didn't introduce Jandita Lopes, who is a community health worker for Good Samaritan Medical Center in Brockton. And she started this year under really difficult circumstances without all the training that you mentioned. And she's doing a remarkable job. And Brockton is fortunate to have a strong base of community health um, advocates, community health workers through the Neighborhood Health Center. And I've learned a tremendous amount um, about them, their value, their role through my experience with Jandita, the health center, and also through our um, connection with the Chana. Um, so my name is Monique. I'm vice president, as uh, Ron said, of a few different things, and it keeps changing, and that's wonderful. <laughs> I've been with uh, uh, Good Samaritan for six and a half years, and I'm pleased and very happy to be joining my colleagues to talk to you about the Collaborative Care Committee. Uh, I did want to thank Ron and the planning committee because to make this event happen took many hours of pre-meetings and organization and I really think the sequencing of the topics and uh, the variety of the topics has been very um, educational and I've really enjoyed the, the, the diversity so thank you for that. And the Collaborative Care Committee, what does that mean? I'm going to explain it. <laughs> so as we've discussed uh, you have population health management, but also the social determinants of health. Um, that's what really we started looking at two years ago at Good Samaritan, and it's really blossomed throughout the Steward Healthcare Network and also within the community of Brockton. And none of you are going to find anything um, extraordinary about this slide other than these are the issues that you all experience probably in your daily lives and that many of your patients and clients experience. So we took a close look at that and how the social issues affecting people were manifesting in healthcare and more specifically in our emergency departments. So we developed a committee and a charter and my colleague and friend Andrea thanked her president so I guess I have to thank mine. I don't know why they put a non-clinical person in charge of a clinical committee at the beginning, but it seems to be working. Um, we started as an internal group, really looking at who was this patient population. Um, for us, we defined it as any patient who had been to the emergency department more than six times in a 12-month period. Um, I will talk about the characteristics of these patients in a moment. Um, and then we knew that we could not solve the problems of these patients in the hospital, in the emergency department, with our case manager, our social workers, the director of the emergency department. So we knew that we had to um, go beyond ourselves and collaborate. And that, again, was a really critical role of the CHNA because of the relationships that I had developed um, through our interaction with the, with the CHNA is really how our committee was able to grow and evolve. Next, please. So the frequent user characteristics, and I'll just give you an example. For Good Samaritan, we had um, our number one patient who had 64 visits in the emergency department in a 12-month period. And that might, might sound high, but one of our sister hospitals outpaced us at over 100 visits in 12 months. So I'm sure you know all of you who work in hospitals and health, um, health centers um, understand, and even those of you who work in the social service side, uh, we interface a lot with our homeless shelter, they, they know the syndrome and they are very aware of the cycling in and out. So we developed some strategies, and I think this is important because it really shows, again, um, the, the need for the collaboration. So there were some things that we did internally in terms of developing resources to trying to identify the population, get the right data, but then we needed our, our friends in the community. So the health center, for example, the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center was really, really critical to get us up and running. We had a lot of patients in common, and when I called upon them and asked them to come in and talk to us about the patients who were coming through, they were not only willing, but they dedicated a person to be a permanent part of our committee. And that has been extremely helpful because, as you know, you're trained as an emergency 
provider. You're seeing one trauma after another. It's kind of counterintuitive to say, oh, stop, there's Monique again coming through. Let's have a talk with her and see what's going on in her life. Why is she here for the third time this week? But in fact, that's what we were asking our own providers to do and asking our community partners to help us find solutions to some of these problems. So we started with technology, which was very important because that's how we were able to see who was on, in our emergency department on that day at that moment. You know, taking a look back 30 days or 60 days isn't really giving us a picture of what's happening right now. So that was important. Then we developed care plans. So if Monique was coming in three times a week, why? And what could we do, either alone or in concert with uh, the primary care physician or with other resources in the community? And not just through the Chana, but really we have a robust group that meets every month. It could be 20 to 40 people and multiple agencies have come forth because we're all incentivized really, as costs were mentioned, to find the right care and the right setting at the right time for patients. And although it is our obligation to take care of folks when it's medically necessary in the emergency department, there are many better scenarios for patients and their families than the ED. Another um, important component, and we're in year three of the medical legal partnership, is we identified that a lot of our patients have ancillary legal needs. Um, in some cases, undocumented issues, uh, maybe not as much insurance as they're, they are eligible for. So we have an attorney that works part-time, and we offer that service free to our patients and also to our community partners uh, with whom we have patients in common. And it's funny because I was at another community meeting around homelessness, and, and next to me, a woman named Ruth, uh, I met for the first time, and she said, your MLP, Medical Legal Partnership, helped me with back rent. And that intervention meant she was able to get $500 to keep her apartment, and she pieced it together, so instead of being homeless, she's able to stay in her apartment, and hopefully healthy, and out of... Um, the emergency department, so that was gratifying. We've also implemented narcotic guidelines. They're guidelines, not policies. That's to help our emergency department providers be able to have conversations with patients who um, do come in frequently. If they have pain issues, we refer them to the pain center or back to their primary care physician. And that was a large subset of the patients we were seeing initially. And again, I can't emphasize enough the integrated and coordinated care with our community partners. We're now really focusing a lot more on that linkage with PCPs, and I think everybody uh, realizes how important that is. And of course, you all just talked about the community health advocate, and so that's something that we've introduced and hopefully will be expanding across our network. My last slide is very busy, and all it really means is we can do a lot within a hospital and with our own clinicians, but it means nothing if we don't have you, our community partners. So when our um, patients leave, whether they're inpatient or through the ED, and they have those issues that I talked about, those chronic issues, we need the community resources, they need the community resources, and it's not just about giving them a number or a resource or a list or a website. Uh, again, those barriers, some people don't have computers, some people don't speak English. Uh, it needs to be a handoff. It needs to be a personalized introduction. It needs to be, as we talked about, transporting them. Um, so we're really working hard, and we would not be successful without uh, the commitment from all of our community partners. And the last slide I have is results. So we started with 20 patients because our universe at Good Sam at least is 600 frequent users, which is a little mind-boggling how to get your arms around those 600, and it's very dynamic. They're all coming in at different times. So we started with 20. We focused on those, and patient number one dropped from 64 visits to in the 30s, and we looked at the top 20, and that, in fact, um, was true for all of them. So we were able to achieve a 51% reduction in their visits over six months. They had active care plans, they were being actively followed, actively managed, and um, that to us proved that these strategies could be effective and could work. So our challenge now is how do we expand the development of care plans and uh, just continue to be mindful of this issue and work patient by patient 
try to uh, continue to achieve those results. And I'm very pleased uh, to take questions at the end, but I'm going to transition to my colleague, Deb from Morton. Focus at Morton Hospital, while we would like to reduce some of our uh, repetitive emergency room visitors, uh, we looked at our inpatient population. And while you may say, well, what is the connection with the inpatient population and repeat readmissions with um, Chanel? Well, I'm glad to say that um, many of our members of our um, Greater Taunton Chanel group are also connected to referral resources for the patients who are in the hospital when they're discharged. And not always do, they, do the patients really need more hospital medical care when they come back to the hospital. They may have put it off for so long that now they do have to be admitted. Um, they don't have the healthy foods. They're not receiving the exercise. Uh, they're not participating in the exercise. Uh, they're not drinking enough water. They're not following whatever their um, uh, treatment plan, care plan is that their doctor um, has suggested. So with the help of people in the community, whether it's community health workers at um, one of our uh, housing um, uh, uh, facilities, whether it is visiting nurse, um, Council on Aging, Bristol Elders, um, CCBC has a wonderful community support program. So engaging all of these agencies, we also engage them at the Shana. So it's a full circle. It is a full circle of all these different agencies and community providers. You can see from um, the all-cause uh, readmission means that I've come into the hospital today maybe with um, congestive heart failure. I leave and then I come back with um, a broken <coughs> leg. Uh, and if this is within 30 days. This is the measurement. So they not, are not related causes, but it's an all-cause. And so all cause from uh, fiscal year 10 was 14.2. It went up in fiscal year 11 to 15.3 and decreased in fiscal year 12 to 13.9. And as I say, those are not related causes. The real, uh, you, and you will never, a hospital will never um, eliminate readmissions within 30 days, obviously, because you may leave here and slip on some ice and then have to come back to the hospital. But let's look at those Prevent, potentially preventable readmissions. Patients who have chronic illness. You've heard that many t that phrase many times today. Chronic illness. And by having the education and the support and the community health workers out there as a resource, many times patients don't have to go back to the doctor, but they just have some questions. And that community health worker will be an excellent resource for those questions. So those patients with congestive heart failure, you can see we're 29.7 in fiscal year 10. Fiscal year 11 went up to 30.7 and have dropped. Again, there is no magic bullet. There is no one cause for any of these. But I certainly believe, and all of us at the hospital do believe, that with the connections and the help of our um, support uh, agencies, that this has had a huge impact. Uh, patient, the PN stands for pneumonia. And you can see the decrease, a 30% decrease. And AMI is acute MI. There has been a significant decrease there. Um, COPD, there's been a huge um, decrease. And um, it, with the COPD patients, that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I'm sure you all know. Um, with you, we hear how smoking has decreased, and that definitely has had an impact with that population. So we're very happy. You can see that they are large numbers. And you can see the goals over the right-hand side, the 50 percentile goal, as well as the 75th percentile goal. So we still have a lot of room for improvement. But you can see by the percentage of change that we are headed in the right direction. And we definitely, we are the hospital, we have prescriptions, but we are not in the patient's home, where so many of the community providers are in the patient's home. And that's where the patient lives, that's where they manage, and that's where they can be empowered to take care of these things and live with chronic illnesses, not have the chronic illnesses manage their life. Um, Brittany has a case from St. Anne's. 
Hi, my name is Brittany. I am the Health Promotion Advocate at St. Anne's Hospital in the Emergency Department. So now that you've heard a little bit about what, how a care plan is created and the processes that we've gone through to decrease um, ED utilization, you can hear a case study to see what the outcome was. So let me give you a little history on this patient. This is a 67-year-old widowed female who lives alone in Fall River, Massachusetts. She has a, a past medical history significant for COPD, is oxygen dependent, has breast cancer and remission, cerebral palsy, osteoporosis, and lung disease. Between, and this is a typical patient that presents to our, our hospital on a daily basis. Between January and July of 2011, this patient presented 19 times to the ER. Seven of those resulted in an admission for shortness of breath and COPD exacerbation. While she was admitted to the hospital, there were numerous attempts by social work and case management to connect her to community resources such as a VNA, palliative care, to see what was going on. After we had started the implementation of the care plans in effort to decrease ED utilization, the social worker, case management, in addition to ED staff, created a care plan for this patient. The idea was, when she presented to the emergency department, was it really shortness of breath, or could there be some underlying mental health anxiety disorder relating to her visit? When she represented again in July, the care plan was implemented by the ER physician. The patient received a social work evaluation and actually ended up, the result was being recommended inpatient psychiatric treatment. When the patient was admitted, she received both a pulmonary consult for her uh, COPD and shortness of breath in addition to the psychiatric consult. What they had found out is she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder with mania related to the numerous steroid courses that she received because of her complaints of shortness of breath. She was discharged home, with again with a VNA, but in addition to a partial hospital geriatric program to support her in the community. Since 2012, she has presented only two times to the emergency department, and the last time she was sent to a rehab to, for an additional support, and she has not returned since. Next slide, please. So this is just um, kind of a flow chart that explains what our process is in the emergency department. So once a patient is identified using either Amalga, which is the computer system we utilize to track visits, or if another ED staff or social worker feels like this patient may need a little bit more extra support the next time she comes in, uh, a team is assembled to create the care plan, and then eventually after the care plan is created, our hope is that our computer system will flag it so that all of the providers in the emergency department will realize this care plan is here. Please refer to it so that we can support the patient at all hours of the night. And so lastly, this wouldn't be possible without the community partners. So we would like to thank you all for your support because we wouldn't be able to be successful without you. So some examples are Bristol Elder Services, our um, community health centers, the visiting nurse. Does anybody have any questions for Monique, Deborah, or I? In the back. So what's the reaction to the frequent flyers when you're trying to get them not to come to the DC? Are they, you know, do they want to keep on coming back to the emergency room? Are they happy with the treatment plan? Do they push back? Uh, all of the above. It's a process over time, so you have to develop a relationship with these folks, and it is quite a challenge because in the emergency department, it's usually, in their minds, an emergency. Uh, they could be intoxicated. There could be multiple issues going on. So um, we become very experienced at having conversations with these folks and introducing resources and support, and CCBC is a great example because they will actually send somebody to the emergency department to talk to the patient and invite them to participate in the program and extra support. So we just keep trying over and over again. And if I might just add, it's a real advantage having um, a sisterhood of hospitals because we have patients who travel amongst the hospitals and um, one of our um, CSP from CCBC, uh, one of their clients who we had connected 
uh, but at our hospital was at a different hospital and the client himself uh, broke down in tears when he saw the CC, the, wrote the worker happy, not sad, but happy that she actually cared enough to follow him and track him down and um, his um, number of visits to the emergency room have dramatically decreased. He has a trust in her and um, she takes him to the doctor's offices and uh, pharmacy, etc. But it really, um, after a while, it does take a little while, but they, they build that relationship or linkage, whatever term you want to use, and they're very connected with them. They do, they trust them. So they, they're happy that we've made that connection. I think I'm getting the smiley face. <laughs> Hillary Lovell, Health Marketing Coordinator, and Joyce Dwyer, Senior Executive Director of Old Colony YMCA. Uh, we'll talk about this partnership between Signature Healthcare, Brockton Hospital, and Old Colony YMCA. Good afternoon. Um, I actually just want to start off by saying what the TANA has meant to me, which I know a few folks have mentioned today, but when I started with Signature Healthcare back in 2010, so um, I've been with the, with the organization for almost three years, it'll be three years in January, um, I was the first person to take the role. Um, at the time, before I was hired, Signature realized that they were being more reactive to community needs than they were being proactive. So I'm, you know, I, I came in and really started from scratch. To be honest, I mean, there were relationships, but they weren't strong. Um, and when I when I began working, one of the first people I met was Nancy DeLuca, who um, used to run the care coordination program for Signature. Um, who many of you know in the room. She was part of the uh, Greater Boston Chana. She was on steering committee, etc. She introduced me to the concept of the Chanas. Um, so I began going, and um, it was just wonderful. I mean, the networking that was involved, the people I met, finding out everything that was already going on in the community and how we could be part of that um, has been a huge um, asset for me and my role at Signature. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I'm, I've since then, even through that Chana, met Brenda Viveros, who many of you know as well. I think she left a moment ago from BMC HealthNet um, from Brockton. But she also sat in multiple Chanas, who then told me about the Taunton one. So it, I, now I'm on steering committee there as well. So it's really um, many things have happened for me from being a, a member of the Chana over the almost three years that I've been with Signature. So thank you. So um, again, uh, Ron, thank you for that introduction. Um, wellness Together, bringing education and healthcare to uh, the community. Um, I'm not going to today speak on one particular program. I'm going to touch upon a few and how we've collaborated with those community partners. So first, um, I know this morning, one of the first presentations was, what is a Chana? And uh, it can be many things. This particular one, we utilized the 2010 Community Health Needs Assessment um, to identify the community needs and um, you know, to, to identify the programs <coughs> in our primary and secondary service areas. Um, some of those um, health disparities have been mentioned multiple times today. They include asthma, tobacco use, diabetes, nutrition, obesity. So, so the programs that we have brought internally within Signature Healthcare, as well as partnered with those in the communities, really have to do with many of those disparities. So I just want to glaze over this slide really quickly. Um, some of the wellness programs that we have brought in-house, um, we have been running free Zumba classes for the community uh, Wednesday evenings for about a year and a half now, which is really exciting. We had a big celebration. You'll see the bottom right picture there, that is me in that picture, but that actually is, um, we celebrated, um, we had healthy snacks after class, we did extra things at class, but one of the nice things was that it, it lasted over a year and it's continued to stay strong. Um, we actually recognized the individual for the best attendance, so she's standing there with a certificate with the instructor as well, so we had a great time. Um, this summer we... Um, we ended up having a kids Zumba hip hop class, which was really great. That was every Wednesday as well. And we had boys and girls, and they came every week, and they looked forward to it, and it really just kept them moving over the summer. Um, we've done healthy cooking demonstrations, of course, and screenings, etc. So, so one of the first programs that we have uh, done, we've done it for a couple of years, and we hope to continue, is we've actually held an annual uh, asthma camp. Uh, the Greater Brockton area has um, high rates of asthma, um, and we have worked with the Brockton Asthma Coalition. I know there's members of that coalition in this room as we speak, and um, many of its members to host an annual asthma camp. Um, and it really is to educate the parents, it's to educate the children, 
and um, even educators themselves, individuals within the, within the public school system. So um, this is just kind of highlighting a little bit um, about what happened at asthma camp and some of our partners. Um, Linda Cahill is here. There she is. Yeah, she was on hand uh, for, for the asthma camp we had back in 2010, talking about the importance of asthma action plans. Um, we've also had uh, self-help. They have a healthy homes program. Uh, I know John Eastman is here, and then Linda Barrows, I believe, uh, was in the room earlier. And then um, BMC Health Net was a great uh, resource as well. They had their um, well-known Sunny pay the pay the kids a visit and, and you know work work with the children that day. So these are actually just some pictures of asthma camp. Um, John Eastman, I warned him. <laughs> I warned him before I put his picture up here that he he piloted up there actually talking to our uh, president and CEO, CEO, Mr. Holland, and his wife. Um, on the picture to the top right, that's actually a teddy bear clinic. That little teddy bear is wearing a nebulizer right now, and the kids can go over and, and kind of talk to the um, pediatric nurse who's, who's there with them. And then down the bottom, uh, last year we actually played a, um, an asthma sort of Jeopardy game. So it's a little game show for the kids to take part in, so it was a lot of fun. Next is Changing Diabetes Day, which actually um, this past June was our first one. And I'm not sure, um, many of you may have heard that Brockton um, actually had Brockton Knocks Down Diabetes, which was a two-week initiative that was really, um, the two-week initiative was really led by a bank, oddly enough, Harbor One. And um, many different uh, community organizations were involved in that. Signature Healthcare's particular focus was on the kickoff of those two weeks, which was Changing Diabetes Day. Um, and as you can see from all the logos, that doesn't even include half of who was involved. Um, it was a great event. We had multiple partners that offered uh, the free screening educational seminars. There were physician panels. There were exercise um, areas that were provided by the Y for adults and for children. Um, it was just overall a great day. So these, again, it just breaks it down, a couple of the things that were done. Um, again, the physician panel, uh, one of our diabetes educators talked about, so you have diabetes, now, now what do you do? Um, and then we had guest presenters, um, healthy cooking demonstrations, children's fitness areas, et cetera. But again, all of those partners on the previous slide were such a big part of that, and it would not have been such a, there were over 400 people who came that day to take advantage of, of all of the resources provided, and it really would not have been possible without all of those partners. And these, again, are just some of the pictures. To the, uh, the top left is actually our healthy cooking demonstration. That's Jared, one of our chefs. The middle photo is uh, one of our clinical nutritionists from the hospital playing Nutrition Jeopardy with some of the attendees. And then the bottom right is the, uh, the YMCA. Luckily, it was a beautiful day, so the Y could be outside. They had adult Zumba going on, and then they had a children's uh, obstacle course for the kids who attended, so it was great. So now I'd like to turn it over um, to talk about one of our stronger partnerships, specifically with the Old Colony YMCA. Um, for the past maybe year and a half, two years now, we've been working closely with uh, the Old Colony YMCA, um, and Joyce Dwyer um, has been wonderful to work with. She is the Senior Executive Director uh, at the Old Colony Y. She uh, oversees three branches out of the, out of the group, and, and I'd like to turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. It's, um, so, as Hillary had said, we do have a partnership, and we're very um, fortunate to have that partnership with Signature Healthcare. Um, and it's the Old Colony Y. The Old Colony Y, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, but um, we are a large organization, um, and we have what we refer to in the world as six traditional branches. Um, and those six traditional branches are in East Bridgewater, Brockton, Stoughton, Easton, Taunton, and Middleborough. Um, and we serve over 35,000 um, members um, through those branches. Um, so, next slide here. So, the partnerships that we've really been working on with Signature are, are in three program areas. It's our Live Strong program, which is now um, just started in our East Bridgewater branch. Our KEEP program, which is Kids Exercise and Education program, which is in our Stoughton branch. And then our smallest winner program, which is really our spin on Biggest Loser, um, which is in all our branches. <laughs> so the first one is, is a Live Strong program, and I know Nancy from South Coast is here. They also have, were fortunate to have this program as well. But this is our first, um, our first run of this program, and like I said, it's, run, it's done at the East Bridgewater branch. 
and the why the USA got the funding um, from the from the Live Strong um, Association and then disseminated it throughout the Y's. Um, so we are starting this program at the East Bridge Water Y um, with the help of Signature kind of educating us and helping us understand cancer patients. I know Deb is in the room um, and she has really been really helpful in helping us understand the patients, build empathy for the patients and make sure the environment is cohesive for them to be successful in. So it's a free program. Um, you, you don't have to pay to be a member of this at all. You just come and get a referral to the program and we will take you in and put you through a 12-week journey. Um, and um, during that time, you will um, you know, have the opportunity to exercise and meet other patients and also get some advice on how to um, you know, get back to, to your life and, and keep healthy um, through the journey. So, like I said, we are doing it with um, the, the support and help from Signature um, through their patient navigator, um, and really just to make sure there's, the, you know, that Signature patients are well taken care of throughout their continuum of care. So the smallest one, and like I said, it is our biggest loser program. We are in our 14th season of, um, of the program. It is a 12-week program, and it is similar to what you saw or did see on TV, The Biggest Loser. Um, it is a comprehensive program. It is a weight loss program. It's 12 weeks, um, and each um, participant has a chance to work as an individual with their um, fitness coach or also with a team. Um, but where Signature really helped us with this is on the nutrition piece of it. Um, so they have really given us access to the nutritionist either through um, through emails or through um, flyers or presentations. Um, we have kickoffs and banquets and you know, Signature has really been instrumental in helping us um, with all the nutrition components of the program. And um, this program here, the last program, is um, we call it KEEP. It's Kids Exercise and Education Program and we actually work with Signature um, pediatricians on what it is and what it would take to get kids um, you know, active and help them with their weight loss. So the pediatrician sat down with my staff, um, kind of gave us some guidance as to what they thought it would take. Um, and then collectively we applied for the grant from Chennai, which I thank you all for. It's been very great. Um, and they, we did continue the nutritional support into this. Um, again, this is another free program to the community that we offer in our certain why. Um, and we get referrals from the pediatrician um, and they guide us through the 12-week program for the children. So I think Hillary's going to take us home. <laughs> All right, thank you. So um, really one of the things that um, we haven't mentioned yet is that the um, collaboration is even, um, it's a little bit different in this case because the CEO and president, both from Signature and from the Old Colony Y, meet regularly, talk regularly, and they really want to build on the relationship and really um, assist the community in some uh, program that's needed. Um, so we're really fortunate to have that, and uh, it's really beneficial to have the support of senior leadership when, when you're moving forward with any of these initiatives and the assistance from those around you um, who are in the community. So we appreciate it. Thank you. I talk really fast, so she just gave me my five minutes. I think I went the quickest. <laughs> and even more so when I'm up here in front of a group like you. So. <laughs> time for questions. Any questions? Or did they just come upon that themselves? You know, to be honest with you, I would love to say it was all me. It was all me. I completely did that. But to be honest, I think um, I think it, part of it was me, but then I think part of it was that Mr. Holland is out in the community himself, and he wants to be involved. Um, and so he had met Vinny Matarano out and about, and he's met uh, many others. Uh, Mr. Holland and Vinny both, they, there's Pioneering Healthy Communities, which is run from the Y of the USA, which is currently, um, it's been going two years now? Mm -hmm. Two years um, in Stoughton, and Mr. Holland's part of that steering committee. I mean, he sees the need and he really wants to be um, in it and involved. Um, you, I don't want to speak for the old colony, why, but from, my, from and Joyce yes. is shaking her head, yes, but 
really what, um, from my experience with the Old Colony Y, what they try and do is if it's a new program, they try and pilot it at one location, work out those kinks, and then they, their goal is always to spread it out to all of their branches. All right, thank you. What a great day, huh? <coughs> Monique uh, praised the planning committee for having assembled and so carefully pulled together all these, these six presentations and how they all fit together and what a wide variety we selected. And the, the, the truth is, um, there, there's so much variety out there, we, there was no likelihood that we could actually find things that were so closely matched that they duplicate each other. We invited the hospitals uh, and, and others to offer a, uh, a presentation, and they, that's what they offered, and that's what we selected. So it wasn't uh, a very laborious task. Uh, but I'm very pleased, actually, when it all came out together at the end, we did have such a great variety, as, as well as some common themes. And <laughs> thankfully, one of the common themes was about collaboration, because that's what today was about. And uh, so I was pleased to see that. Before I, I make a final remark, I think Wendy Garfield from United uh, Fall River, United Neighbors of Fall River, um, just wanted to give you a little bit of a, an update on a project that the intention I was working on. So, Hi, everybody. Thanks very much coming. for coming today. I think I'm big enough now. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's just take a second. If you are on this conference committee, can you stand up and be recognized? Because I know people work very, very hard to make this happen. <laughs> So the common thing that we heard today is this interconnectedness relationship building. But what resonated with me was the uncommon partners that came together. For many, many years, we have all worked in our independent silos. And the fact that we're at the point now where partners that you wouldn't normally see together are in the room and talking together is very exciting to us. And we have been approached and we've been developed a relationship with an uncommon partner as an interchina. And we want to tell you a little bit about what we're looking at as perhaps our next project. So we were contacted by Walgreens. And we had a very interesting meeting, the Interchina, with the regional manager of Walgreens. And then we had a follow-up meeting with managers of Walgreens from, I think it was seven or eight different um, towns in our area. And we're beginning to talk about a joint project for, for Chinas in the areas and Walgreens to sponsor the drug takebacks and that Walgreens would offer support in terms of gifts for the first hundred people that brought back their drugs, that we would work with them. And so this is an, uh, an idea that we, we want to talk more about, and we'd like to bring more people into the discussion. We're not quite sure where we're going with this, other than the fact that the Walgreens people are very excited and want to really make this happen for the April drug buyback, uh, takebacks, which uh, I guess traditionally happen at that time. So that's very exciting. But the next part of the conversation was, how can we set up a more sustaining system, maybe utilizing hospital pharmacies, util utilizing police departments, and the Chana to have a regular place where people can go anonymously and return their drugs on a regular basis. So I think this kind of innovative, out-of-the-box thinking is really the way we see this inter chana committee and the, the, the group of people sitting in the room together as we move forward. So we're very excited about it. If you're interested in learning more and working with us on the Walgreen, we'd love to have the drug people in the room. A lot of you come from agencies that are doing substance abuse. We'd love to have you at the table. Uh, hospitals, community health workers, we'd love to have you at the table so that we can begin this discussion. We're going to have a meeting for a statewide inter -Chana. So there will be representatives from Chinas throughout the entire state of Massachusetts. And we're going to begin to talk how we can have this power collective to work together. So if you know me, you know I always like to end with something inspirational, and I usually say the same thing. So Margaret Mead, one of my great, great heroes in life. So to paraphrase Margaret Mead, she said, never doubt that a small group of committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Mm -hmm.